call yours, Mr. Chair, if you'd like to start. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Metropolitan Trans Santa Cruz Metropolitan Transit District meeting of November 20th, 2020. Uh, we'll begin with a roll call, please. Morning. Morning. Good morning. Director Botswarf. Here. Director Kaufman Gomez. Director Gonzalez. Here. Good morning. Director Leopold. Here. Director Lind. Here. Director Matthews. Here. Director McPherson. Here. Director Myers. Here. Director Pegler. Here. Director Lothrell. Here. Director Rutkin. Here. Ex officio Director Henderson. Here. Ex officio Director Northcutt. Here. Director Kaufman Gomez. Not here. We have quorum. Thank you very much. We do have a quorum and we'll begin. Uh, we, today's meeting is being broadcast by Community Television of Santa Cruz County. Uh, our first item on the agenda is a board of directors comments. This is an opportunity for members of the board of directors to make comments uh, for items not on this morning's agenda. Do we have any comments? John Leopold. Uh, uh, thanks chair. Uh, you know, this uh, meeting is likely my last meeting as a member of the uh, board of directors of the transit district. I've been serving here since 2009. Uh, I'm very proud of the work that we've done uh, all together. Uh, we've had to uh, rescue the uh, the agency at different times financially, but the community has stand, stood strongly behind uh, uh, the Metro. Uh, it's a valuable service. Um, I'm really proud of the work that, that we've done to shore up the financing uh, of the organization. Uh, I think there's a lot more uh, good work to, to be done. I wanna express my appreciation to the members of the board who have had a chance to work with uh, the uh, drivers who do so much uh, good work, all the employees at the Metro. I'm especially appreciative of Val Clifford and the work that he's done. I was uh, glad to play a role in uh, being part of the group that hired him. And I look forward uh, to uh, continuing to see the strength and growth of the Metro. I'm currently the vice chairman, so I'm gonna be resigning that post here today. Uh, and I wish you great success in the future at, at the Metro. Thank you, John. Um, I'd make a comment myself. I wanna thank you for extraordinary service to this district and this community. Uh, you, you have not simply sat in a seat on the board of directors here. You've taken real leadership on a number of very difficult issues, uh, helping us get out of, as you pointed out, a financial, serious financial crisis that Alex Clifford led us out of, but it takes a board to make that happen in a serious way. And I think you took real leadership over that. That's never easy. It's easy to sort of add new services and provide new, things for the public, but to make hard decisions about what has to be cut at times or how to restructure things in a serious way. And uh, I appreciate the leadership you've shown there. It's, there's no question that our community is in a better place for the work that you've done in terms of public transit in this community. I won't go into all your other accomplishments and other areas. I think we'll save those for other fora, but uh, for sure, you've been a key player in the transit district and we appreciate your many, many years of great service here. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Ed. Yeah, I, I just want to echo some of Mike's comments. You know, you know, John, just just to, to keep it real, a uh, lot of people are on this board and, and people come and go, but but you have totally been committed to Metro uh, all in. I, I, I can't think of anybody else who, who has contributed more to keeping Metro uh, going as it is. And uh, I wish you well of your, your new endeavors. Thanks, Thanks Ed. Uh, Mike, I'd say the same thing. Bruce, uh, yeah, I... Um, it's, you just can't uh, gauge how much my uh, John has put into this uh, and uh, made things happen. And so much of what goes on Metro, the a core of who our ridership is right in his district as well as the supervisorial district, but he's always looked out for the whole, uh, the, the breadth of the county and making this thing work as best as we can. And uh, yeah, I know that when we uh, hired Alex, it was really an important uh, decision that we made so we could get on track again financially. Uh, we've had some adjustments to make, and, but John's been in the lead of uh, helping us make those uh, decisions. And I really appreciate his uh, participation, his leadership in this, uh, getting Metro on the right track, literally. Uh, so it's gonna be sorely missed and we're gonna, we just appreciate everything you've done, John. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Bruce. And I'm proud to have a leadership position with you on the Measure D campaign, which provided a nice uh, a, a bit of funding for the Metro. Yeah, another thing that should be recognized. Thank you. Any other comments in the uh, Board of Directors comments this morning? Mr. Chair, Cynthia Matthews. Wait, go ahead, Cynthia, please. Oh, I just want to add my appreciation for John. I came on when I think the worst of the financial crisis was over, but <laughs> um, still so many deep decisions over time. And um, John, you have provided leadership so above and beyond everything on this issue. So thank you on that. Um, uh, <laughs> there will be lots of changes going forward and, and just really appreciate the um, institutional memory and commitment and political acumen to, to keep this going. Thank you. Thank you. And Donna yeah. Myers. Donna Myers, go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, John, you know, you and I have known each other for a long, long time. I was very excited to serve with you on this board um, and hoping it would have been for a longer term. Um, but I just want to thank you for all the guidance and um, just your commitment to what transit really means to the people who need it most in our communities. So um, thank you very much for everything that you've done. So, and I also just want to extend my thanks to Ed and Cynthia as well. Serving with both of you has been a, a real pleasure as well. And, um, and Trina. So we're losing quite a bit of our board. So I'm wishing you all, all the best. And thank you. We, we uh, make Donna, I don't, I, I don't think either one of us could have figured out when I was a student at UCSC sitting across your kitchen table that we'd be serving on a transit board as elected. <laughs> I know, when we were 18. Yeah. <laughs> or in watching, my case, John, watching, I think with some uh, direct mail services. Yeah. <laughs> watching, watching LA Law together. <laughs> <laughs> it really happened. <laughs> I have a it's really dating us. Yeah, I have a question of Julie Sherman, uh, our uh, counsel. We've uh, just lost our uh, vice chair and uh, likely not to be replaced until January or February, uh, given the way that these appointments get made uh, in terms of where we're going next. And we make our appointments, I think, in either January or is it early February, I'm not sure, uh, for new officers for the, for the board. Is it uh, possible for us to uh, replace our vice chair right now at this meeting? So uh, not not right now because it's not agendized um, under the Brown Act, but um, for vacancies, what your board bylaws provide is that anytime there's a vacancy, you just agendize it. So you can agendize it for January, which will be your next meeting if you had one in December, but you won't. And then you can nominate and fill that position in January. Thanks very much. Um, I'm going to suggest that we that we do agendize this for our next meeting, uh, and not wait for the formal reappointments that happen perhaps a month after that or something. And uh, I, I hope to be able to serve fully in this position through all the way through. But it's good to have a vice chair in case uh, there's some, some need for to fill in, um, which does happen. Any other comments from board of uh, directors? Yes, Mike. Yes, I, I don't know why I, my computer kept freezing up. So um, anyway, uh, most everything has been said, but John and I were elected the same year and ended up serving on LAVCO and, uh, you know, various commissions and um, really uh, the flight path issues, particularly that were intense. Um, but I uh, want to appreciate and thank you and echo what has been said. Your dedication has, you know, really been wonderful to watch and, and work along with you, and you will be missed. Thank you, Donna. Really appreciate getting a chance to serve with you. Thank you. Okay. Um, oh, one additional separate comment. Wanted to acknowledge um, that RTC, and I won't pull it up, but... Um, sent out a notice as far as the uh, grant applications to CTC for uh, Watsonville and Santa Cruz multimodal um, corridor project and acknowledged the work and uh, the contribution Alex and uh, the staff at Metro had made in uh, this moving to uh, be approved by CTC and hopefully successfully uh, 
obtained. So thanks, you know, nice to see that acknowledgement and thanks to Alex and staff. Thanks for that. Mike. Yes. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, tell uh, John, uh, from the city of Watts Hill, thank you for serving on Metro uh, and always supporting South County and its needs. Um, it was a short pleasure for me to uh, be with you, uh, but I hope to continue our friendship on into the future. Thanks. Thanks, Aurelio. Ron Rothwell. Uh, everything's been said, I think, pretty much, and you can get a swelled head as this continues much longer, but uh, I just wanted to add my uh, comments that uh, I would truly appreciate what you've done, John, and I know that you've been in, really involved in, in uh, countywide politics for a very long time. I voted for you. I was really um, terribly sorry to see that you lost. Um, this, is, <laughs> this has been a horrible year in so many ways, and that's just one of the additions that we can add to 2020 that we'd like to forget about. So um, I wish you well. I tried to contact you several times, but for some reason, your email, um, at least on my computer, wasn't working. So I wasn't able to contact you. And I'd, I'd like to contact you sometime and find out what your, your plans are for the future. John, send him an email so he can get uh, back to you. Uh, I will definitely send him an email. And uh, Dan and I had the great pleasure of working at Cabrillo before uh, we got a chance to work on this uh, board. So you were absolutely you were absolutely wonderful. Uh, you and John Laird were like the two greatest board members I think we've ever ever had. Uh, and uh, we were so sorry to see you leave, but you went to higher places. <laughs> yeah, proud of my service on Cabrillo. You should be. Any other comments? Good, Larry Pegler, Mr. Chair. Thank you. I, I appreciate the help in identifying people. There's a lot of faces on the screen here. Larry, go ahead. Thank you, my audio died for a moment. Uh, John, you know, I almost never repeat things that have already been said, but I need to today, and that's to the appreciation for your leadership and your involvement as a resident of the first district. I very much appreciate all the work you've done for us. I haven't known you since LA Law, but it's <laughs> that. So I look forward to working with you more in the future and best wishes always. Thank you, Larry. Best to your family. Uh, uh, proud to be able to work with you on this board. Any other comments? Okay. Thanks again, John, for your many years of great service to this district and the public that it serves. Mm -hmm. um, next, we have oral and written communications from the public on items that are not on this morning's agenda. Are there any written communications? I didn't see any in the packet. We do not have any, Mr. Chair. You do have uh, Mr. Peoples, I believe, wishing to speak. Okay, Brian Peoples, go ahead. You've got three minutes, Brian. You're muted still, I think. Brian Peoples? Sorry, I'm there now. Hey, you now. go ahead. You know? Hey, thanks to everybody. Brian Peoples with Trail Now. We're a grassroots organization um, trying to get the world class Santa Cruz Trail opened. Um, you know, one of the things we really like to emphasize is there's three main corridors um, that are critical uh, SoCal Drive, Highway One, and the Santa Cruz Coastal Trail. We got to open it up. We can't leave that closed. You know, we support it, Measure B. Um, our support was significant. We, we initially didn't support it because 24% um, of the funds went to a train. Um, the money was, uh, the RTC redirected money to Metro and we became a big supporter. And we like to recognize that we were um, a, a big player in making that happen. Um, yeah, elections are a big deal in, in the way we get things done around here. And, you know, we like to recognize Jimmy Dutra. You know, we supported Jimmy Dutra. We're really excited that he won. He didn't have the support from his other council members, but um, it really was great to see um, Jimmy and we're looking forward to him coming back. And of course, uh, we did support um, the, uh, the not the incumbent for first district, um, uh, supervisor, nobody thought we could do it, but we, uh, it was overwhelming. Um, I think John, I think you're a great guy, you know, um, appreciate, I do appreciate the work you've done, the commitment you made for the community. Um, I, sorry that we're on different teams. Um, but again, 
just want to say thank you for your time and your efforts. And um, but anyways, I just wanted to make that um, opening remark. That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Peoples. Uh, any other comments from members of the public on items not on our agenda this morning? No hands showing at this time. Give me another second here. Okay. Um, next we have, uh, are there any comments from labor organizations this morning? Looking, no hands, no hands. Going once, going twice. Uh, Mr. Chair, you have one hand from Michael Rios and just a brief footnote, uh, we do have uh, board member Trina Kaufman Gomez with us. Welcome, Trina, and uh, go ahead, Michael. Hi, board. Um, I just want to, um, you know, thank John as well, um, John Leopold, for having an open door policy with us here at the union um, and uh, always keeping us in mind and always uh, letting us reach out to you um, during the, uh, you know, any tough times that we had. Um, it worked out really great. You were a great leader and uh, yeah, you will be missed, definitely. Thank you for your comments, Michael. Thank you, Michael. Any other labor organization comments? I see no hands. Okay. Um, are, do we have any written communications from the Metro Advisory Committee? We do have a report this morning from that organization. No written communications, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Next, we're coming to the consent agenda. These are all the items numbered nine dash something, nine dash one through nine dash 11. We're gonna take action on these all at once unless uh, a member of the board would like to pull one for further discussion. Um, if members of the public would like one of these items pulled for further discussion, you can let us know. And then if any board member wants to support that, we'll pull it off the agenda for further discussion. Does anyone? First of all, on the board, want to pull any item off the consent agenda for further discussion by the board before we take uh, this action on the entire I, thing. Yes. I, I'm sorry, I, I wanted to, uh, I didn't know if we're going to go through the whole list, but there's other, Ed Bottor, um Trina Kaufman Gomez, and Cynthia Matthews will also be leading us, I think. They're going to all be back at our next meeting, Bruce. They will be, okay. You, because you we won't, our rules are that we don't replace them until they actually get appointed. They're appointing bodies. They're city councils. Okay, very well. I did now. Okay, good. So we have to win this a little longer, thankfully. We may or may not be back again. <laughs> <laughs> Depending. Okay. Uh, anyway, I appreciate the sentiment there. And, and share it actually because we, we're not going to let them go without some comments either. <laughs> um, again, I see no one in the public, anyone on the board, again, anyone in the public want to discuss any of these items on our agenda, on the consent agenda, numbers 9, 1 through 9, 11. I'm not seeing, seeing any hands, hands Mr. Yeah. Chair. Mike, I just, I just think that, you know, on 8, 8.6, um, you know, the ridership reports, it's, um, you know, it's just to point out, it's a tough times. You know, our ridership decline has been 85, 90%, and we're still rolling. And uh, a great deal of credit to keep us going and, and safe at the same time under this COVID uh, that, um, crisis that we're having. So I just want to say thank you to the staff, uh, to the, uh, our, our administration and everybody for keeping the buses rolling in these very, very difficult times. We're keeping our head above water, so to speak, and it's not easy, but uh, thank you. Um, I just I just wanna make a comment that uh, under these trying circumstances, we're still providing the service and we just hope we get those riders back as soon as this thing is over. So thank you very much to the administration, to the bus drivers, to the, the whole staff of Metro. You've done a phenomenal job under some very trying circumstances. I want to follow that comment just by pointing out that I don't think it's an exaggeration to say that one of the safer places you can be these days is on one of our buses. Yeah. We have, you know, you'll be, you'll be separated from other people. Everybody will be wearing a mask and, and there are plastic sheets between, uh, now actually a plastic uh, plexiglass sheets between uh, various rows in the, in, the, in the bus and so forth. And so it actually is quite a safe way to travel at this point. And I wanna encourage the public to consider using the bus uh, to get where they need to go. 
Um, I want to make a motion to adopt our consent calendar, but I do see that James Sandoval has his hand up. Okay, James, let's hear your comment first. Can you hear me? Yes, you're good. <clears throat> Sorry, I didn't get to say my piece during labor communications. I thought I had my hand raised, but I just wanted to say my piece on John Leopold too. I wanted to give him credit. He had an open door policy with our union too. Um, he always answered my calls. I had a great dialogue. It's, it was an honor and a privilege to work with somebody like John Leopold, and I appreciate everything you've done for Metro. Thank you. Thank you, James. Thanks for your comments. Any other issues on consent agenda? I'll take a motion to approve it by Ed Bottorf, and who would like okay. to second that motion? Larry Pegler has his hand up that I grabbed first. Um, so we have to take a roll call vote on the consent agenda. I'm sorry, I got the motion by Director Baltorf, but I didn't catch a second. Was second Larry? Larry? Larry Pegler. Thank you. Okay, roll call. Director Baltorf. Aye. Director Kaufman Gomez. You're muted. <laughs> yes. Director Gonzalez. Aye. Director Leopold. Aye. Director Lynn. Aye. Director Matthews. Hi, Director McPherson. Hi. I think I heard an aye. Hi, Director Myers. Hi, Director Pegler. Hi, Director Rothwell. Hi, Director Rotkin. Hi, unanimous. Okay, that passes all those items. Thank you very much. Um, and there's some significant things in there. They're not controversial things, but they're important to our district. Uh, we've hired a new. Uh, manager, I think that's uh, important as well. Um, next on our agenda, we have employee longevity uh, uh, awards. And uh, this is recognizing people who've served our district for a, a period of time. In, in this morning's case, either 15, in one case, 20 years of service. Our, our most valuable asset as a district is the employees who have been here and know how this district operates and provide the service to the public over the long term. So we want to recognize these people and take a moment. Uh, we, we don't have enough time to give them the full recognition they deserve, but I do want to say something brief about each of them, if I may. Um, the first is, uh, and I may butcher people's names, I'm afraid. That happens uh, in this situation. But uh, first is Idan Alvarado. And is it Idan? Is that how that's being pronounced? Has been with fixed, uh, has been uh, a fixed route driver. Um, uh, just for a short period of time, but he spent many years of the district uh, as the Paracruise operator and want to appreciate the service. Rhiannon Axton has been involved in the union in various capacities, but enjoys mentoring new operators. She's also a very talented seamstress. We have people who have lives beyond what they do at the district. <laughs> Next, uh, Ed Day, these, these people have all served for 15 years that I'm, the names that I'm reading now. Ed Davidson, has been a valuable employee. He's always met each day with a smile and a positive demeanor towards the public. He's devoted to the community both on and off duty. Juan Fernandez Magana, Johnny, as he goes by, started with Metro as a vehicle service worker and then was promoted to bus operator within less than three years. He loves his job and enjoys every day of work. He is uh, proud to work for Metro and never refuses a request to work longer days. He accepts every day with a smile on his face and a positive attitude. And this is after, remember this, 15 years of service. This is not easy work that people do here. William McIntyre, or Bill, is a true professional, dependable operator since he started with Metro. His calm demeanor and friendly disposition are consistent every day. Ezekiel Osorio, or EZ as he goes by, has been a true professional since his first day. His family's from El Salvador, and he's a role model and mentor for new operators. Jaime Renteria. Jaime is proud of his work with the operators union, especially in participating with, accident, with the accident review process. He's a devoted and loving husband and father and loves outdoor activities with his family. Hector Torres, can be seen daily going above and beyond for all of his customers. 
His positive attitude and love for his job are beyond any others. He's a loving father. Valentin Zarate. Valentin got his name because he was born on Valentine's Day. He loves riding his motorcycle to work and has an infectious laugh. Joy Olander is the senior payroll specialist for Santa Cruz Metro. Joy, following her dad's love for Metro, was hired as an accounting technician in 2005 and moved up to payroll within a few years. Joy supports Metro employees, management, SEIU, SMART, CalPERS, and payroll processes. Joy continues to provide payroll integrity for Metro, which is obviously critical. And let, let me ask uh, Daniel Zoraga if he has, can make a couple comments about Chris Sullivan. I don't know Chris. Daniel, this, um, I just sprung this on Daniel. Okay, good morning, um, Director. Chris Sullivan began um, at Paracruz as an operator. He is now a paratransit uh, supervisor. Chris is great. It's, he's actually our trainer. He trains all our new drivers. Um, and he's great at um, de-escalating situations. He's the person that we rely on whenever we have a problem with a passenger. Um, Chris is, is married and um, he is, he's been an excellent employee here at Metro for the 15 years that I've known him. That's great, thank you very much. And thank you, Chris, for your service. And last but not least, op, uh, working for the uh, district for 20 years as a bus operator, John Otto, enjoys his time off work in the sports car, driving with the top down. He enjoys his daily interactions with the public as a bus driver and is grateful for the many years of service that he, as an operator. And we're grateful for his service to this district. Again, recognizing 20 years of service with this district and we appreciate that. This is our most valuable asset, these employees. I think we should have a round of applause for these uh, people who have served our district for so long. By the way, they will all be receiving um, uh, the, the actual formal uh, 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 notice of this uh, through, the, through the staff. We, that won't happen in the meeting. We would, be, we would be standing up and recognizing these people, but we won't be doing that here because we're remote in the meeting. Next, we have a, a re resolution of appreciation for two people who are retiring from the district, Chris Payne and Don Martin. Let me ask, um, uh, first of all, we should probably do a motion that recognizes this appreciation. I'm looking for that motion. So moved. That was by second. Don Leopold and seconded by Donna Lynn. Okay. Any further comments before the motion? All those in favor, we have to have a roll call vote. Every vote has to be a roll call vote. Next generation of bus drivers. That's definitely an I. Yes. <laughs> but he doesn't like early mornings. <laughs> Director Bottler. Aye. Director Kaufman Gomez. Yes. Director Gonzalez. Aye. Director Leopold. Aye. Director Lynn. Aye. Director Matthews. Aye. Director McPherson. Aye. Director Myers. Aye. Director Pegler. Aye. Director Rothwell. Aye. And Director Rotkin. Aye. Unanimous. Okay. Hold on just a moment. Let me, uh, Alex, let me ask you who would be the appropriate person to read a little bit of background information on the two I'm people who are hiring. I'm afraid I don't have that in front of me. The, uh, the two retiring, let's see, I think that's going to be Freddie. Freddie, are you on for uh, Chris? Yes, I'm on. Okay, why don't you go ahead. And... Okay, um, so Chris Chris Kane, uh, she's worked, she worked with us several years already. Um, I don't know exactly the, how many years, but she's a wonderful person. Um, the whole the whole staff, uh, every, I mean, everybody knows her. She's a custodian. Uh, she's uh, all over the place. Um, one thing that really stands out there, she's a really sweet person. 
Um, and what we always remember of her is out of her kindness of her heart, every Christmas, she brings them uh, hair to, um, apple cider to all the employees, the staff. Wow. And, and, and like I said, that's just out of her kindness of heart. And it, she is a really a, a special person. And the other person is Don Martin. Yes, so Mr. Chair, I'll ask Eddie to turn on his microphone and I'll just chime in first by saying that when Dawn started, she started working in my office actually, working for Gina. And um, she was really fabulous. She contributed greatly to the successes of our office on the administrative side. And I hated to see her go when, when she promoted and moved over to Eddie. And Eddie, why don't you talk a little bit about the work she did for you? Yes, uh, good morning, uh, Chair, Boyd. Uh, yes, Don Martin worked for me. Uh, she total years at uh, Metro was 15 years. She worked for me in uh, keeping us straight on our budget and making sure all of our invoices was paid and taken care of. She has one daughter that worked at Metro as well uh, in HR. Um, her hobby, I can't really say what a hobby is, but I know she, she loves her, her pets, her dogs and stuff. So uh, there's quite a bit more I could say, but I wasn't expecting it to, right at this moment. But anyway, Don had, uh, we had a, a really reliable uh, employee uh, coming to work and stuff. And uh, we hated to lose her uh, when she would, came in and announced that she was going to retire. It was, it was very a, uh, kind of a bittersweet for us. So um, that's, well, thank you. Thank you. As often the case, well, employees, we're both happy for them and sad for ourselves when they decide to retire. <laughs> Mr. We have Chair, Don yes. uh, Don Cremay. Don, go ahead. Our director. Good morning, everyone. I just would like to add that Chris Kane has been with Metro for 21 years. I think that was important to, to mention as well, Dawn. So 15 in the later position, but before that, six years, apparently. Uh, no, no, no. Uh, Chris Kane, uh, the first one that Freddie spoke of. The oh, I see. Yes, yeah, 21 years. Wow, thank you. Wow. For clarifying that. All right, we've taken the action of approving this. They're going to get plaques, which I've seen copies of, but uh, I don't have here remotely, obviously, but those will be delivered. Those are actual physical plaques, not just a picture on a computer screen that are on their way to them. Our next item is uh, about the transit corridor alternatives analysis. The Santa Cruz Metro <coughs> is a partner with the regional Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission in a study to determine what form of public transit makes the most sense on the uh, existing rail corridor through the county. And uh, John Rigo, our planning and development director has this item. Yes, good morning, thank you, Chair. Uh, I just wanna briefly introduce this item by saying that this has been a very collaborative process uh, between Metro and RTC staff over the past several months and the consultant team. And, and we feel our input and our concerns and our ideas uh, were heard and incorporated throughout. So I thank uh, Ginger Dykar, senior transportation, our senior planner at RTC and, and project manager of this effort for uh, this way. And I think we're gonna hand it off to uh, Steve Decker, uh, lead consultant at HDR to go through the presentation and recommendations. Thanks, good morning, Steve. Good morning. Also, uh, uh, Metro and RTC staff are here to answer any, any questions as well. Thank you. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, I'll, I'll wait for the uh, presentation to uh, show up on screen. And then I'll just ask whoever's operating it uh, for the next slide. I know there'll be a little delay <laughs> between the slides. I, I assume in your presentation, you'll, you'll be explaining where we are in this overall large process, right? Yes. Yeah. So at the beginning, I might as well start now before the slideshow goes up. Um, there have been three major milestones as part of the transit corridor alternatives analysis. Um, started about a year ago. Uh, if we go to the next slide. Uh, milestone one was we really evaluated and identified, you know, the goals we want to adhere to during the course of the study. Uh, well, uh, talk about the uh, 
uh, the agenda here. Primarily, we're talking about the performance measure results and then our proposed draft recommended locally preferred alternative. I'll try to provide a brief overview of the four alternatives that we evaluated uh, in this performance uh, measure analysis, this detailed analysis. Talk a little bit about the, the pros and cons of each um, of the four alternatives that move forward. Uh, talk about the recommended draft locally preferred alternative and then get into some of the next steps, including stakeholder outreach and schedule. Thank you. Next slide. So just in terms of the milestones, we've had three major milestones, some with multiple steps. The first milestone was identifying the goals, screening criteria, performance measures that we went out to the public. Uh, stakeholders had uh, an initial public online, uh, uh, you know, public meetings as well as online meetings. Went through that process probably in February of this year before uh, COVID. The second phase, based on all that information, or the second milestone, based on all that information we developed in milestone one, we did a high level screening, looking at, I don't know, 19 to 20 different types of uh, uh, alternatives, which we called our universe uh, for potential core services for the rail right of way. And then we use this initial high level screening to narrow down the alternatives to about four. Uh, and we call them, you know, bus rapid transit, commuter rail, light rail, and autonomous road train, which is also a rubber tire uh, type of service uh, using the right of way. When we got through that analysis, we moved those uh, four into value engineering. And this is where we did a lot of work with Metro. Metro was involved throughout uh, Metro and RTC to really define options for each alternative, service plans, costs, uh, ridership potential, travel time savings potential, we looked at four different alternatives for BRT and two different alternative alignments, service plans really for uh, light rail, commuter rail, and autonomous road train. And now that's the first part of uh, milestone three. We're now into milestone, uh, the second part of milestone three, which is the detailed performance evaluation, which is the focus of today's discussion. Really comparing these four alternatives to one another uh, from value engineering, we did choose select one alternative, one option for each of the four to move forward for detailed analysis. And those are really the best performing. Uh, and then we use this analysis to define a draft recommended uh, locally preferred alternative. Next slide. So here are the four alternatives. I'll provide a brief overview of uh, the pros and cons for each of these from starting with bus rapid transit, show the alignment. Uh, next slide. So the bus rapid transit, this is the, the preferred uh, uh, option coming out of the value engineering phase that we just spoke about or just spoke about. Uh, starting in, uh, you know, the local roadway system in Watsonville up um, Highway 1, if we're going northbound Highway 1, uh, using, taking advantage of potential bus on shoulder, uh, and then going through city streets in Aptos, Capitola to the right of way, uh, and we do avoid the uh, San, uh, Santa Cruz boardwalk, bypass that, and then get back onto the right of way. There are 23 stations, 15 minute uh, frequencies of service, and the service runs from 5 a.m. to 12 uh, midnight. Next slide. And through our value engineering and the detailed analysis, we identified some pros and cons to BRT. Obviously, there's some strong ridership different types of ridership markets are served with bus rapid transit. There's a longer travel time and shorter trips are served as well as long distance trips, you know, the Watsonville to Santa Cruz trips. There are lower costs uh, as a pro uh, compared to the other alternatives. Um, and, uh, you know, there there is some flexibility uh, on this service in terms of uh, addressing potential future climate change issues and the adaptation of, uh, of this service to future technologies. In terms of some of the cons, it's definitely longer in terms of the trip, probably about 90 minutes on average, but it does serve a variety of uh, shorter distance trips uh, of, of riders. It doesn't use the full right of way, it uses about seven miles of the right of way and uses Highway 1 and other uh, local roadways uh, to support the, um, the uh, alternative. And uh, there are some issues with uh, compatibility with freight rail uh, in the future. Could you explain, uh, next slide. Could you explain before you move on, why is it that it uses only a portion, seven out of 32 miles? It wouldn't be full 32, but 
seven of the miles on, on the right of way. Uh, maybe you could explain briefly why that's the case. Well, uh, when we did the, uh, when we got into the value engineering process, uh, we wanted to take advantage of bus on shoulder opportunities to provide some travel time speed. We didn't feel we needed to use the entire right of way uh, to really garner some ridership, uh, increased ridership in Watsonville, as well as Santa Cruz. And we had some better connections there. Uh, considering this trip was uh, somewhat longer, you know, in the 90 minute range, if you went from point, uh, for, you know, start point to end point. So we, we looked at a mix of the roadway, um, local roadway highway one with the rail right of way as, as part of the option. We looked at about four different um, scenarios and worked with um, uh, BRT. We did assess potentially using the full right of way and the cost would be uh, pretty high. Uh, that was one reason to really focus on some using some portion of the, the right of way and as well as to garner as much potential ridership as we could. In other words, the cost of actually building a roadway for the bus to ride on on the corridor would be more expensive even than rail in some cases, I guess. That That is correct. And then and the rail right of way would really not be rail anymore. It'd be more of a roadway. And that, that would be a, a high cost, as we'll see with the autonomous road train. Thank you. Go ahead. Hey, Steve, this is Dan at UCSC. Just to, just to clarify, the right of way um, along is the rail. Right, so yeah, you just that's, I'm sorry. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so it's um, and it's not wide enough. Uh, you know, the right of way is literally the rail, so it's not wide enough to have a road next to it or anything like that. It has to be on top of the rail. So if you want to see it for BRT, right? Well, well, we were considering that for sure, and then we would we when we were talking to Metro, we were considering two way, you know, operations, you know, two lane operations, different directions, and we knew we couldn't accommodate that. Uh, on the full right of way, but there were there are ways in which you know you could uh, have one way operations that could work effectively as it would with with the rail options, uh, but that that is one consideration for sure the the operations of the the, the system. Thank you. Go ahead. By the way, I should the public should be aware we're going to take comments from the public after we have this presentation. Go ahead. Uh, the, the, there's no order of significance or priority here at all with how these are presented. So the next one is uh, commuter rail transit, uh, which uses predominantly the right of way from Pajaro Station in Watsonville. The rail right of way through um, natural bridges does travel through the San, uh, Santa Cruz boardwalk. There are, you know, 11, the lower amount of, or the you know, smaller amount of uh, stations, and we're looking at frequencies of 30 minutes in the uh, peak periods and 60 minutes in the off peak periods running from you know 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. Next slide. Uh, some of the uh, pros and cons, um, ridership is very strong. Uh, it provides that long distance trip, trip to from Watsonville to Santa Cruz. Uh, definitely more reliable service here and faster travel times. We're talking almost half the travel times of BRT, predominantly because of the different type of service and it's predominantly on the rail right of way. Um, can operate effectively, uh, commingle with freight rail. Currently now what's happening in, in the Watsonville area with current uh, freight rail operations as well as potential future. Um, and does, you know, use uh, the entire right of way. In terms of some of the cons, uh, the costs are somewhat higher than BRT, uh, the somewhat lower ridership, but the ridership is strong for each of these alternatives and serving a variety of different markets. Um, and there may be some impacts uh, in the future that we need to design for in future phases here as we move this project forward and in, in design and environmental to, to address potential climate uh, change issues. So light rail uh, transit or LRT is the next very similar uh, service plan with more stations. There's, I know there are usually with the commuter rail versus light rail, there's there's more spacing distance between stations with commuter rail for a variety of reasons. Uh, the speed and weight of, of the trains versus light rail, for example, and the different types of services. But this LRT has about 15 stations compared to 11 for commuter rail. Um, 
and they operate very similarly with a different time of service, you know, 30 minute headways or frequencies all day from six to 9 p.m. tracks uh, with the, uh, you know, follows the the uh, rail right of way alignment uh, from Pajaro station to natural bridges. Very similar pros uh, and cons to commuter rail, you know, definitely reliable service, faster travel times, reliable travel times. There is, uh, you know, um, uh, some BMT uh, vehicle miles traveled reduction from autos and therefore reduced greenhouse gas emissions from autos with people who switch uh, to this uh, alternative. It happens with each of the alternatives, but this one provides greater uh, relief or greater improvement. Um, there is commingling with uh, freight rail, both currently and potentially in the future. We might have to separate the services freight rail from uh, light rail uh, by time of day. Uh, that's part of it. And there is, as well as with um, commuter rail, a, a great opportunity for transit-oriented development near the stations, which could, uh, you know, increase, augment uh, ridership. In terms of the, the cons, a little more expensive than commuter rail, right in the middle, uh, more expensive than um, uh, BRT. Uh, ridership, while strong, is a little lower than um, uh, BRT. Uh, there is the climate uh, change issue as well, too. And one of the key uh, issues here is there will likely need to be a transfer at a Pajaro station to connect with inter-regional rail uh, opportunities, whereas commuter rail provides that, could provide that one, uh, one seat service for folks from, say, Monterey up through Pajaro into Santa Cruz. Before we move to the next, uh, on that last one, could you briefly describe how how is it that we can have two-way service on a single track? I think a two-way service is, uh, you know, I don't have my operations guy here, but we have uh, the thing called sightings that will need to be developed where, uh, you know, one direction needs to, you know, we will have two directions during the time periods, predominantly in the, um, in the peak uh, flow period, you know, in the morning, you know, going northbound, south going, uh, the afternoon going southbound. So there'll be sidings where trains can park and wait for trains to pass by. And there'll be locations up and down the corridor, four or five locations, maybe less that will accommodate that. And there will be signal systems uh, and safe systems in which they, that will allow these operations. So that's pretty typical of a service like this. Thank you. In terms of autonomous road train, which is vehicle, you know, rubber tire on pavement, um, you know, very similar service uh, to an alignment to light rail, very similar vehicles. Uh, in the case of this, we're starting the service not at Pajaro Station. There'll be a shuttle connection from Pajaro Station to uh, uh, autonomous road train right at Lee Road uh, at the rail right of way. And there are a variety of reasons why we did that. Uh, including when you pave, you know, we would have to pave the rail right of way and there's really no room to expand the right of way for a paved system to also accommodate freight rail in that area. Uh, so we decided to move that up a little bit, you know, three miles or so uh, to, um, you know, avoid those freight rail operations to continue those freight rail operations with this alternative. That's why the uh, shuttle service was provided but the there's a very similar um you know uh alignment once it hits lee road through natural bridges less number of stations but very similar in terms of the light rail next slide so in terms of the pros and cons definitely strong ridership is all provide um does reduce uh, greenhouse gas emissions from autos with the switchers potential switchers to this uh, uh, alternative, definitely provides this uh, uh, potential to adapt to new technologies in, in the future, right? It is a new technology. I think it's been implemented in China and has yet to be implemented here in the United States. Um, does support, you know, transit-oriented development as well. Some of the cons are it's very expensive because we would have to pave the full right of way. And we talked a little about that a little bit during the BRT discussion. Um, and 
there is freight rail compatibility or will be freight rail compatibility issues. And the travel time is a little bit longer because of that connection, the connector to Pajaro. And the train will go a little slower. So that sort of provides the overview and I'll spend a, a few minutes on the recommended proposed locally preferred alternative, which we're calling passenger rail and moving both commuter rail and light rail, rail forward into uh, the next stage of the study, which is really going to focus on um, design, preliminary design environmental, but is there a question? Okay. And we talked a little bit about this uh, earlier in terms of the pros and the cons. Uh, these services are very similar to one another and we can do, you know, in the next phase of this study, when we're really looking at the project to define the project, this is where, and it's pretty typical, pretty common to move, you know, more than one alternative forward from an alternatives analysis like this. And this is our opportunity to really look at specific issues with stations, uh, location locations, you know, the travel speeds are going to be generally the same. The ridership is generally the same. Um, uh, FRA is the Federal Railroad Administration. And if we go with commuter rail, we need to adhere to their requirements for those types of systems that also operate with uh, rail, uh, freight rail systems. If not Federal Rail compliant with light rail, for example, we have to adhere to Federal Transit Administration requirements and different kinds of uh, strategies to make this safe. And I, we, we talked about that earlier with positive train control requirements for um, commuter rail and centralized traffic control, very similar things with light rail. So we have to work through all those issues and they're very similar. Uh, the frequencies of service are very similar that we talked about. You know, they're made basically 30 minute headways. The service is from 6 to 9 p.m., 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. We didn't talk about level platform boarding, but that is a key feature here for access of all types of uh, uh, users. Uh, makes it easy to access the vehicles at, at boardings, at platforms and stations. Um, there is the opportunity to uh, tailor the vehicles to um, accommodate more bicycles. And with the trails, that's gonna be an important feature. And we've heard that throughout the project or um, you know, um, uh, other types of mobility devices. So these the, these types of services, the passenger rail services sort of bubbled up uh, to the top in terms of our recommendation. And then uh, we are planning to use non-fossil fuels to support the alternative here uh, as technology increases and improves with uh, electric battery, hydrogen fuel cells, et cetera. So that's that's where we, we are recommending to go as our draft. And so some of the benefits we talked about, faster travel times, greater travel time reliability. Um, you know, for example, bus on shoulder would, or BR, BRT would use bus on shoulder to get out of the main, uh, you know, travel congestion on highway one, but there are travel time reliability issues there in case you know of accidents and those kinds of things so these services provide some greater reliability of services that uh, travelers can depend on they both reduce uh, vmt uh, auto vehicle miles traveled and greenhouse gas emissions they provide a lot of service to not only disadvantaged uh, communities in santa cruz but to the entire community uh, they provide this rail network uh, compatibility that we're very interested in working with Caltrans and other services in Monterey uh, and other services up and down the, the coast to Northern and Southern, Cal uh, Southern California. Uh, we feel that this, based on our experience, provides about a 13 year time frame to implement shorter than autonomous road train and BRT, for example. Um, and we're assuring the continuous use of the corridor for transit and trails really great opportunities for transit oriented development, which could increase, you know, people getting out of their cars, increase, you know, use of the trails, increase use of alternative modes to auto. Um, you know, funding is a, is a big issue. We did a detailed funding analysis uh, as well as cost estimate estimation analysis. And with California, 
really focuses focusing on passenger rail. There are you know significant significant state funding sources that we can tap into uh, for uh, passenger rail versus the other modes. Uh, and you know, I, dare I say uh, that uh, federal there may be more uh, dollars of, uh, available for from federal sources for transit as well with a potential new administration. Uh, I have heard as recently as earlier today uh, about um, getting back to uh, pre-current administration uh, types of uh, you know focus on transit. So that that could be very, very helpful. Um, anyway, uh, those are some of the key components, including you know that connection with the uh, level boarding and access for various uh, all users in terms of the benefits of the locally preferred recommendation. In terms of the schedule, uh, we are currently in uh, our milestone number three online open house. We started on the 6th, it's gonna end on the 27th of November. This is where all folks, public stakeholders can provide uh, input into this uh, planning process. We provided the draft report for people to review as well and comment on. Uh, we have conducted a couple of chat rooms uh, last week and Wednesday night where we had, you know, up to 20 or more uh, folks asking us questions that we were commenting on and responding to in the chat room. And then um, we are going to have our later this month, our RTC advisory committee meeting. We had our partner agency meeting yesterday, sorry. Um, we are gonna spend, after outreach is done, we're gonna spend some time revising the draft report and refining um, you know, the, the recommended preferred alternative as needed based on public and stakeholder input. Um, we will have our RTC meeting, public hearing presentation of the final draft report in January, and then trying to seek approval, obviously in February with RTC. Um, in, in February and April. So that's sort of the schedule um, as we're moving forward. Uh, and this has been a very, you know, intense schedule. And now we're in the December, well, the November 2020 uh, component of the, of the schedule. And so I'd like to open it up for questions. And we have Ginger Dykar, uh, possibly Luis Mendez, Brianna Goodman from RTC, as well as myself to answer questions, and then Pete Rasmussen, uh, Matt Marquise, and um, John uh, potentially to answer uh, response to questions as well from Metro. So uh, we're going to, at this point, not this is not time for discussion, but questions to clarify on the presentation from board members first, then we'll hear from the public any comments they'd like to make. Are there questions from the board? Yeah, um, Mr. Bruce, um, I, I wanted, in, as far as Metro goes, I'm, I'm concerned you about the last mile. First of all, I want to say thank you to the RTC um, and the cooperative effort between RTC and Metro like we've never seen before, and it's happened for the last several years, so much appreciated. Uh, I'm, you know, on the last mile, um, th that component of it, we have a lot of responsibility on Metro. And just uh, get a general idea about what the cost might be and it's maybe separate from this report per se but i'm just uh want to get an idea of what that last mile component if it is going to be a, a cost to metro what uh or how that would work uh, mm -hmm. would they be part of the overall little grant program that we might get into or how would that work and please explain what the last mile is for those members. Well, it, so you get that. to a station and uh, you drop off uh, the, the passengers and they have to go, uh, say, from uh, the, the rail line up to Cabrillo. You know, and so I would guess that maybe we might have a, a bus going from that stop point uh, to up to Cabrillo, that kind of a situation. Yeah, that's the question's clear, Steve. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, if Ginger and uh, Pete want to jump in. Um, so in terms of what we did in the analysis, we did not get into a detailed first last mile analysis, um, you know, at each station and we didn't get into a very detailed station analysis either, which will come in the design and, uh, environmental stage. But our assumption was that there will be good solid connections of existing Metro bus, 
uh, to these stations if, if you know a service exists today as well as other private first last mile um, types of services you know the the um, um, not shuttles but uh, you know the bikes uh, ride hail services those kinds of things um, and then there is the opportunity of course to build additional services is services in you know other types of shuttle connectors etc to first last miles there certainly is no reason why we wouldn't be able to connect with private you know entities as well you know such as shuttles to and from you know uh, the university or other types of services other businesses that might offer those kinds of services so while we didn't get into that analysis that needs to be done as part of you know the next phase here for sure and in terms of the costs i think that's something that uh, obviously the cost of those types of services will need to be addressed in that study as well and i think it could combine and use a, a, a different uh, a variety of, or a mix of different kinds of funding sources um, okay thank you understood I, I thank you very much appreciate it other questions from board members larry pegler next thanks mike uh, Steve, could you elaborate briefly on the criteria of resiliency to climate change? Is that associated with proximity of the corridor to ocean, or can you explain that, please? Well, we, we did look at um, regulatory issues. We did look at floodplains. We understood the proximity or the location of the rail right-of-way primarily that is in, you know, sometimes it's floodplain areas and coastal. So obviously that was one of the considerations here that said, hey, there could be issues in the future, you know, and usually these are very long-term issues, maybe even shorter term here, you know, shorter than 50 years. So we looked at those and evaluated those at a very general level at, at that level. But certainly when we get into the design of this service, any service really that's in the coast, the uh, climate change sustainability design components, you know, need to be built into that. To, to keep this viable for many, many years, if that makes sense. Other questions? Open for hands. I don't see any, but I don't see anything face here. I'm seeing none at this point, then. We're going to go to the general public. Uh, again, comments or questions. You have three minutes each to make your comments or questions. Um, if it's a question we can answer, we'll try and answer it. Otherwise, we'll certainly get back and try and respond to any questions people ask. So we're looking for hands from members of the public who'd like to speak. Mr. Chair, you have Mr. Peoples and you have uh, somebody that just shows up as JL. Let's ask JL first since we heard from Brian earlier and then we'll come back to it to Brian. JL, I have to unmute yourself. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, my name is Johanna Lighthill. And I'm an Aptos resident, and I just wanted to make a couple of comments about the TCAA. Um, I'm both excited and confused about it. I'm, you know, I'm excited about possibilities for improving transit options in our county, but I'm also confused about the proposed um, preferred alternative. Um, I read the the 282 report it, uh, page report is kind of daunting, but I think I found to be most helpful is your attachment B in your agenda today, which is called alternative evaluation results. And um, if I advise everybody to look at it, it's a line by line comparison um, of each uh, alternative with each metric. And I, I think that with this presentation we've heard, I think that the, um, the benefits of bus transit have been kind of skimmed over. If you go um, through that results, you'll find that there's a lot of advantages of bus over rail, um, including highest frequency every 15 minutes rather than rail 30 to 60 minute uh, frequencies, longest duration of service, the bus runs till midnight while rail quits at nine. Um, there's the most number of stations within the half mile of disadvantaged communities lowest capital costs, lowest operating costs, the least impact at grade crossings, which is um, related to secure uh, safety. Um, there's the highest ridership countywide, the highest weekday ridership, the highest weekend ridership, the lowest fares, the most flexible for to adapt to future technologies, 
flexible to design for uh, bikes or mobility devices, quieter, least impact on the environment to sensitive areas using ex existing metro stations. And uh, I think most importantly, it allows transit and trail to coexist. Um, Um, I just wanted to comment lastly, is that um, a few years ago, the RTC invited some speakers, uh, transportation speakers, and one speaker called named Jarrett Walker came, and uh, he's from Oregon. And he has a uh, website, humantransit.org, and he's written a lot. And he uh, talks about the transit ridership recipe, and he states, he emphasizes that in any transit facility uh, frequency and duration are key um, components to get ridership. So as you move ahead, um, I appreciate your listening to my comments and I hope that BRT will be uh, raised to the top of the list rather than rail. I think the service to the community is um, more, I think rail service services commuters, but uh, bus would service communities. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Appreciate them. Uh, and then uh, Brian Peoples. Hi, everybody. Brian from Trail Now. Um, thank you for the time. So, yeah, this is a very high level uh, report and doesn't really go into the details, which you really needed to understand it. Um, some things to consider is Aptos Village, you show a station there. Well, there's a parade street. You don't have a spot for a train station there. So that would show it as a deficiency. Um, another deficiency is you don't look at actually the impact to the trail itself. Um, the trail actually from past RTC reports showed there would be more users. It would have a greater impact on transportation, on uh, climate change um, for a transportation trail. So um, making it exclusive to a train restricts the use of it as a trail. And, and it actually, the train will create fencing, will have fences, miles and miles of fencing that you did not address, which is going to limit the access points and how the, um, which will be a, a major constraint. Um, one of the things you say is you're getting funding. Well, if you look in the September, 2015 funding rating scorecard, so to say from the federal government, any type of transit, uh, rail transit for our community would grade very low and you would not um, get that funding. Um, we're really encouraging you to um, understand the transportation requirements as a whole. This is, you 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 didn't do a systems engineering approach of how you do um, design of transportation. You looked at a single entity. You didn't look at how is it integrate it with highway one. How are, you know, right now the, the county's going out and widening highway one and that's the focus to get bus rapid transit there. So you're you're basically creating a, a competitive um, project. So you're gonna go to the California Transportation Commission and say, you know, we need a billion dollars for this train. And oh, by the way, yeah, we want the, the highway one widening. So it doesn't show very well and, um, and obviously we're going to be opposing the train. Um, it, we will be working very, very hard opposing the train, but we will support bus or rapid transit. So, um, you know, let's get some rubber wheeled vehicles on that corridor versus fixed rails. So we're really, we're really hopeful that Metro um, understands that why, why would you create an additional cost to our community that will never be able to use this, this corridor because you, you have this ideology that one day you're gonna have a train. Well, the community is not going to allow it. We're going to be actively working on um, the political front and the legal front. So we're really hopeful that um, the message was sent from the last election that you're gonna support what the community wants and work with us. We think we're going to have a great transportation system. You, you know, I'd love to go to the California Transportation Commission with you, supporting. Yeah, we need to widen Highway One. We need bus traffic transit. We need a trail. 
um, all of that. So we're Thank hopeful you. that you do not recommend rail and you do recommend uh, rubber wheeled vehicles, bus rapid transit. Thank you for your time. Thanks for your comments. Are there other members of the public with comments on this item? I'm looking for hands and see none. Mr. Chair, I don't see any hands either. One more call for that. Any other comments from the public? Okay, we'll bring this back to the board. Let me ask uh, uh, Steve, what, uh, what action are you looking for from us this morning? I think I would uh, point to Ginger for that, if, if you don't mind, in terms of the action. Thank you. Ginger? Yeah, I'm happy to answer that question. Um, it's mostly the input we're looking to receive from the Metro Board today. Uh, so the, action, the action will take place from the Regional Transportation Commission at the um, February meeting. We'll be presenting the results in January, on January 14th. And then the action will be from the commissioner. So today we're looking for the um, input from the Metro Board. So we're in a situation where we could legally make a recommendation as a board as a whole, but I think it probably is more appropriate at this point to have individual comments that board members might like to make to this about this process. Is that my understanding, Ginger? That's correct. Open to comments. I have a brief comment, and if others don't, but I'm waiting to see if maybe somebody wants to go first. I'll, I'll go ahead. Chair. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, first, I, I want to thank uh, the RTC and Metro staff for working with the consultants. <clears throat> you know, uh, one of the things that has been a real pleasure over the last couple of years is uh, is to see the RTC and Metro uh, work closely together. And in two, January 2019, when the RTC unanimously decided to have transit and a trail, um, <clears throat> the RTC accepted the Metro's recommendation to do this alternative analysis <clears throat> because, <coughs> me. because it would be uh, it would be helpful to have the transit district intimately involved in the planning of what kind of transit should go on this trail. And I know that John and uh, his staff has been uh, uh, intimately involved with this. I know we've talked uh, with uh, Alex on that ad hoc uh, committee. And I think that the RTC's decision to look at these four strategies were, were all very good. I, I think that uh, the idea of how we use this corridor for transportation uh, is really important. Not a portion of it for transportation, but all of it for transportation, having a dedicated corridor really makes a difference. And having uh, 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 safe, reliable travel times um, it will help in providing the options for people uh, uh, about choosing how they get around. Uh, you know, we have 18 miles of the trail under design or construction right now. And so the RTC continues on with the building of the trail. And we're gonna hear, you're gonna hear a lot over the coming weeks and months from people who are now changing their tunes because they can no longer say there's gonna be 60 trains a day on this to complaints about fencing and costs. Um, and the fencing concerns, if you look at what's already been done on the west side of Santa Cruz, the, these are not um, you know, uh, prison fences. These are simple barriers that keep uh, the, the, the uh, transit and the pedestrians or bicyclists apart from each other. Uh, they're not unsightly and they work, uh, I think they will work really well. I, uh, I think that when we're looking at making major transportation decisions, can't transportation infrastructure costs money. And it, hundreds of millions of dollars is a lot of money by any stretch of the imagination. But if you look at any piece of the transportation infrastructure, that's what it costs. I mean, the 41st Avenue, uh, overcrossing, if you were to replace it, would it be over $100 million? Uh, you could fund this whole thing um, uh, in part uh, with just that money. So you, you have to make those investments for how they um, make a difference in the long run, whether they actually offer uh, good alternatives. I appreciate the, the, the work that was done here. I think it was that we looked at the right um, uh, pieces of this, right? The economic issues, the environmental issues, and the equity issues. 
And I think that when you look at the through that triple bottom line, the recommendation is really clear what it is we should use. And I look forward to watching this as a as a citizen, uh, but I encourage you to, to take all those pieces into perspective when making a decision. Thanks, John. I'll make some brief comments. So I appreciated the member of the public, JL, who, for, sorry, I've forgotten her full name, who, who made you know comments about the virtues of uh, bus uh, rapid transit as an alternative. Uh, I have to note that uh, the real issue, for at least for me, and I believe for the success of this project, whatever we choose, is that we um, deal with the question of how long it takes to get from Watsonville to Santa Cruz or vice versa. And the, uh, the train is very much faster. I mean, it's dramatically different. If you really want people to get out of their cars, you can't offer them a 90 minute ride to Watsonville. Even under our worst circumstances in the morning, it typically doesn't take 90 minutes. It does, there's some bad days, but it doesn't typically take 90 minutes. To, and this would be to, uh, every day, 90 minutes or so uh, for, for the bus rapid transit. It's not a very attractive alternative for getting out of your car. More importantly is the dependability of the schedule that you know you're gonna get there on time. Otherwise you have the problem and I take public transit, you have to leave a half an hour early to make sure that you're actually given traffic problems and so forth, that you're actually gonna to get to your class on time if you're a teacher as I am, or if you have a job and your boss expects you to be there, you know, uh, when, the, when the day begins, you, you can't afford to like be late 10 minutes or six minutes or whatever it is, you have to be on time. So I think that that's really critical. And the final thing that I would note as a bicycle rider, um, a serious bicycle rider. I, I've been riding less to the university because of COVID, but I used to ride to all my classes up at school. Um, the The reality is that um, the, a, a train has the possibility of adding a whole car of bicycles, for example, which buses, you're gonna have a very hard time getting beyond three bikes on the bus. I mean, we've had that, whatever kind of bus you've got, um, bus rapid transit has some possibility of adding a car like that. It's not out of the realm of possibility, but it, it doesn't adapt quite as easily to that. So for me, those, those are kind of really overriding considerations. In the long run, if we want people to get out of their cars, you, you have to provide a better service with public transit, not just one that'll work or that's adequate or something. Um, so for me, that's a serious uh, consideration uh, looking at this. I have no vested interest in rail versus bus or anything else, personally speaking. I just wanna try and figure out, and I, our consultants are helping us do that, what makes the most sense given the options that are in front of us. So uh, I'm happy with the way this process is going. I'm happy to wait for the public to weigh in on this issue before we come to a final decision about it. But but those, that's what leans me more towards rail based on the, what I've seen from this study. I, I went into the study quite honestly not sure, I would be quite happy to have had bus rapid transit without knowing what the consequences were. And I, I, the work that's been done even before we come to a final decision certainly makes me lean more towards the, and I lean towards the right light rail service, frankly, rather than the commuter rail, but just among other things, it's a lighter train and it has less impact on the neighborhoods that it passes through and so forth. So that's a, an issue of community acceptance. I think that needs to be weighed into this as well. Comments from other members of the board, if any. Mr. Chair, you have, um... Board member Cynthia Matthews, Donna Myers, and I believe Trina Kaufman Gomez had her hand up. Will not order. Cynthia, go ahead. Yeah, I've followed this um, somewhat through the process, um, not living and breathing it, not serving on RTC and all the detail, et cetera. Um, uh, I do want to echo the issue that Bruce raised about the last mile and subsequent the first mile too. Um, the connection to this, I mean, what we've seen today is just, just the system itself, not how does the, how does the rider get to their ultimate destination, and it does seem to me a, a rider is concerned about uh, frequency, reliability, um, speed, etc., but also cost. And so that first and last mile, um, uh, I do recall some coverage of this in previous RTC option presentations, but. You know, when we come to it, ultimately, it will be not just the cost of the ride, but what is the first and last mile cost to the system, whoever that provider is, and to the rider. So I think just in terms of kind of being upfront about expectations, realizing that these are, of course, estimates, but if you're getting on, if you're traveling from your home in Watsonville to your job, Let's say on the west side of San Cruz, wherever. Um, 
what is what it was the total time and total cost because that's really what people are going to be looking for. Thanks for your comments. Donna's next. Yeah, I just want to compliment um, the work of the RTC uh, and the process. Um, I think it's um, been very helpful to sort of see it building on the analysis and coming to the locally preferred analysis or preferred alternative at this point. Very pleased that Metro was so involved in this um, as well. Uh, I think it's been an important partnership to work on this together. Uh, and not be responsive um, to the extent that, you know, we've been doing that work. And so I congratulate both agencies for the work. Um, I too um, really come down to um, the sort of the, the, the ability, the frequency, the ability for folks to get where they need to go, um, cost, those kinds of things. I, I do believe also that those are the things that um, ultimately we need to consider I um, am very excited though by the, um, the light rail and, um, and just very, uh, I, I do agree and believe that we will get more federal investment in these kinds of opportunities in the future. So I think that there is um, an opportunity here as well that um, will be very worth uh, looking at and considering as we, we move forward on the project. So. Uh, thank you to both staffs, and uh, I'm excited to see where we are right now. Thank you. Trina and future rider. <laughs> yes, yes, I figure that um, if we're looking at a historic moment, this is the baby, and by the time he gets to high school, he'll be on those wheels somewhere in this corridor. Uh, it's It's been a pleasure working with both Metro and RTC and, and, the, organ and, and the, the TCAA to work through this project. Uh, and, and see through it to fruition. I know that we also have um, good leadership that's going to make sure that it's an inclusive project, that everybody's voice can be heard and provided with input for this. I, I also know that we're going to do whatever we possibly can for the best leverage in order for us to get this sooner than later on what we can do to move people around this county. Um, it's been quite frustrating living in Watsonville to see anything that has to move on the north end every morning. Um, and even with COVID, we're still seeing a lot of activity on the, the highway and whatnot. And we could be just about ready for high school by the time we see something here. And um, and again, it's I, I really appreciate working with all of the staff on this and um, doing the due diligence. and. Knowing that we'll, we'll get through this and, and see a pro project to fruition. I'm also on the, um, the uh, um, ex officio for the TAM Center as well. And freight is still important. And I still want to make sure that we're hearing the word freight when we're having this conversation. Because if we're doing anything in an alternative, that, an alternative to this, and it impacts what happens with the freight business, um, that concerns me. So I, I always want to make sure that I've included that in the conversation on record because we, we have, what can we take off the highway if we can put it on this corridor to move it around can also help eliminate the GHG issues that we have and the impact that it's had on our, our highway system. So mm -hmm. I, I want to make sure that that's also um, part of what the record is about. And again, maybe he'll be there for a ribbon cutting, you know, when it finally comes to fruition at some point and um, we'll have to, show him the before and after picture when it comes to fruition. So thanks again for your time and your patience and for allowing me to um, work with this project. Thank you. And you'll be one of the people with us, I'm sure, at this ribbon cutting, uh, recognizing your early contributions to the process. Other members of the board with comments? Yeah. Um, Bruce. Um, okay, yeah, I, um, I am probably going to vote against this. Uh, and this is no indication. I think we are obligated to get this far uh, with the passage of Measure D. And I think that the report that we're receiving is, is very well uh, received and uh, very well researched. But, uh, you know, just with the cost uncertainty, and this probably shouldn't come in any surprise that, uh, because of my recent votes on some of this. But uh, I'm just, with so much uncertainty in the cost, we have a new admin federal administration, et cetera. I get that, but I just, uh, I'm just not comfortable uh, moving ahead with this because I'm very uncertain about how the voters might uh, receive this once we find out what the cost obligations are going to be. 
Um, so um, it's a difficult situation to be in, in, in some sense, but uh, that's the reason uh, I probably won't, it's not because I don't appreciate the effort and the thoroughness of this report, but uh, I just have some uncertain things. And I think some others have said, we ought to discuss this further offline possibly, but uh, anyway, uh, that's the way to where I am at this point. And I think I needed to explain that my reason for voting it shouldn't come as any surprise. I don't think to anyone, but um, Thank you for allowing me my input. Thanks for your comments. Other members of the board? Don't see any hands, Mr. Chair. We're there, again, we're not planning at this point to have an overall vote. We're just looking for individual feedback from board yeah. members. Donna Lynn has a comment, yeah. I think. I, it's, it's been a really good process to see. I, I share some of the same concerns about costs. And, you know, before I would, you know, I, I, I was excited to be able to to uh, ride the smart train and hear what was done up in uh, you know Santa Rosa area, and as much as I would love to see it, I would just definitely, in particularly in light of our economic situation, want to know you know how those costs would be covered. But I do appreciate the research, the work, and the studies and the information. I think you know, we all want to have all the facts and know all of our options and certainly have concerns about how we can improve commuting and travel throughout the county. So I'm torn on it. I, I have some concerns about costs and I, I appreciate going through the process and being able to hear all the facts and be able to make later a, an informed decision. So. Thank you. I'll call myself for a brief comment. The, I, I appreciate both Bruce and Donna's comments here um, about cost issues, but I keep looking at the issue of climate change and the, the need that we have to really find a way to address this issue. And um, it's not that, you know, we're, we know the answer or we've figured out the last engineering level of this, what the actual final cost will be. The last mile issue that Cynthia Matthews raises is important. Uh, and those are all things that we can't, you know, this is not gonna move ahead unless we address those issues and have clear uh, information about that. But there's no way we're gonna get out of the situation we're in with climate change if communities like Santa Cruz County can't find a way to get people out of their cars. I mean, that is the bottom line. Somewhere between people disagree, 40 and 60% of the greenhouse gases we generate come from the automobile and or things related to the automobile. And you've got to decide you're gonna start at some point to find a way to address that, even if the costs seem you know, beyond or almost beyond our imagination in the long run. But there's not an alternative to that that I understand. So. Again, none of us have signed off on the bottom line on a particular mode here or that we're actually, that this is happening and we're done with it or something. But I, I think that moving forward with this alternative and studying what, you know, the, get a real final picture. What does this thing actually look like? Where would the stations actually be? And that's our next phase before we, you know, are gonna actually say, pull the trigger and uh, whatever the right metaphor, pull the lever, whatever the right metaphor is to actually decide we're building this, this uh, transportation system. But I, I think we have to keep moving forward with this and understand what the option might be. Without it, I think we're just, it's empty words when we say we care about climate change issues because if we don't have something like this working, we're never gonna address it. So that makes me wanna move ahead, thank uh, our consultants for a really good job. I think they've done a good job of presenting us what the, the, con, the pros and cons of each of these alternatives and, under, and again, not even against each other, but as a whole, what, what, what are the, the consequences of picking one of these options and what does it look like? I think we're in a good position to understand that and move into our next phase. So again, we're not looking for a motion at this point for the board as a whole. We'll take the comments people have made. Those will go back to the RTC for their consideration. Uh, unless there's anybody else on the board with a comment, we'll, we'll end this item here. I see no one else with a hand up. Okay, thank you all for your comments. I wanna thank the public for their comments. Those were. Uh, appropriate comments and weighed in the right tone, I think, and we want to appreciate that because this is often a controversial issue before us. Um, next is the uh, Metro Advisory Committee, or the MAC as we know it, its semi-annual report, and Veronica Elsie, who's online, is going to give us that report. Good morning. I should be all back reconnected again here. <laughs> uh, Good morning, all of you board members, and in case there's anyone listening in the public for the first time, I'm Veronica Elsey, and I am just about at the end of my term as chair for the Metro Advisory Committee. 
And it's always just such a pleasure to come here and report on this dynamic and really worthwhile committee. We, as usual, have had very good attendance since we spoke to you in June. We did lose one member, and that was Jason Lopez, who moved out of town. And we look forward to James Cruz joining us in January, so we will be back at a full complement again. So thank you to the board's ad hoc committee for being so quick and diligent in replacing our committee members. We had a couple of members down in August, but it was because of evacuations from the fire. So I wanna make it really clear just how serious and committed this committee is and that if people miss a meeting, there's usually a really good reason. And so I really appreciate that aspect of the committee. Uh, over these last semi-annual period, we did have the opportunity to meet Danielle Glagola. Um, and we've had some really good discussions with her about various things, as you'll see when I go through this report. I want to bring to your attention as a reminder that at our August 19th meeting, we sent a letter to you, which was in your August 28th packet, where the committee really wanted to commend the bus operators for the work they did in helping with the evacuations in the CZU uh, lightning complex fires. It just really spoke to us about how committed to the community these bus riders, these bus operators are. And we just thought it really highlighted one of the extra values of having such a good metro bus system that don't often get talked about. We've also had two very detailed COVID-19 updates from Alex. We tended to ask a lot of questions and talk a lot about things related to the comfort of the writers. One of the things that we had a good discussion about was the putting back of the service windows at the Pacific Station and the Watsonville centers and when they're open and where customers can ask questions. We also, and we've done this before, we talked about bathrooms again, because one of the things that can be a bit challenging as a bus rider is that because the frequency of buses is decreased, you can have some long waits, say at the station or out at ocean and water or various different things, and then you have a long transit ride. So if you've taken the Highway 17 bus, those don't come too frequently. You get to Pacific Station and now you have to go all the way out to Aptos to go home. You can get pretty uncomfortable. So we did find out about, you know, putting out a flyer at the customer service, at the customer service booth where people can find out which businesses in the vicinity will allow them to use their restrooms. But we hope that this will be a continued item of consideration as we figure out what the bus frequency is gonna be and how we organize things as COVID goes on. We also had a report on your ridership survey, which for the most part was quite encouraging. Uh, some of our members did kind of wonder and hope that Metro really looked at what's that sweet spot gonna be? Because if you really start decreasing some of the routes too much, are you then going to erode that community support and your future ridership that might return? So please do your best to you know, match the things we understand, like the funding, and really try to hang on to the riders. Uh, some of this is that last mile thing that you guys were just talking about. Um, I also should mention that our, our member, James Von Hendy, did represent the MAC at your safety event a few weeks ago, and he gave us a nice report on all of the things that you demonstrated, and most of us have seen it just from riding the bus. So again, um, as I said at the time, um, we've all expressed confidence in what our experiences have been riding the bus and the bus drivers have been nice. 
people have been very accommodating to me with the dog and telling me where other people are and giving me time to squish the dog into a seat further back. And I really want to commend Metro for doing as much as they have just to make the passengers feel comfortable. We also have had some good discussions with your staff about paracruise, maybe co-mingling a bit with micro transit service where some of the paratransit that may not be used because people aren't going as many places, you can call up and get an on-demand ride to somewhere and help make up for some of the loss of some of the bus service. And so we understand that's still being discussed and we appreciate the creativity and the flexibility. We've also had a lot of discussion about the various technologies that Metro is looking at whether to put Wi-Fi on the bus, adding some of the conveniences. We think that was a good idea. We appreciated the candid update that Isaac Holly gave us on the ITS and that we're waiting for it to be a little bit more stable. Many of our members have talked about how at their offices and whatnot, they are really trying to help promote the Splash Pass and because a lot of people seem to think that it's a really helpful way to commute, so you're getting a lot of promotion help from the committee there. Uh, John did include in our packets the Metro Planning and Development Annual Status Report that you received in September, so we are up to speed there. We've talked a lot recently about some of the bus stops. We've had a lot of questions about the Pasatiempo bus stop for when the world gets going again and we have our people commuting over the hill. And what things does Metro control? What things does Caltrans control for improving the bus pad and a few things like that? So we did get a really good report and basically Caltrans has kind of the higher authority on this one. We did talk a lot at our last meeting about the new bus stop signs we asked questions about how they would be designed and where they would be placed and being able to easily locate things like your bus stop ID number so that we can then get more details out of our phone, you know, the phone text message service to find out when the buses might be coming or what might be happening. We talked about the change in putting up all the detailed schedules there and wanted to just remind all of you to keep in mind that not everyone in Santa Cruz County has a cell phone. And that for many of us, you know, where it's such a major part of our lives, it's easy to forget that there are people who still don't use them. And so it's still really important to make sure that people have access to those bus stop schedules in lots of different ways and enough information so that they really can know when that bus is coming until those apps are really out there working and everybody gets a cell phone. We had one member who actually found, um, and he may have sent it to some of you, um, some but not bus stop fitness ideas. This was came from Cleveland, Ohio, and they were really cute about, you know, if we're gonna have to wait longer, let's find some cool things to do while we're standing out there at the bus stops. and do little exercises and, and keep ourselves fit. So we actually had a quite a good time looking at those and seeing what we really could do at the bus stops. Um, in our conversations with Danielle, we got a good look at the safety tips brochure. We talked about putting some other brochures on the websites and other things that we could use those brochures for to help inform passengers about different aspects of riding metro buses. So we also asked again about the passenger code of conduct and we talked with her about possibly at some point in 2021 working on how we can use these brochures and the website just to help market that code of conduct in a, a very friendly way once things calm down and ridership picks up. The last thing that we did this year is we elected our 
new chair and set our calendar for 2021. Our new chair will be James Von Hemby. So he will be presenting to you in June. And I really look forward to working with him as chair. He's been a very active member of the committee and I'm sure that you will enjoy him. Our meeting, oh, Joey Martinez will again serve as vice chair. Our 2021 meeting schedule, we try to look at the key months when you do things like budgeting and things where we wanna make sure that we can give you some valuable input. So our meetings in 2021 will be February 17, April 21st, August 18th, and October 20th. And in closing, I would just like to thank all of you board members for access to you, for the ability to talk with you, for the ability to have Metro staff give up their evenings four times a year and come and speak with us. We are treated respectfully. We are getting our questions answered. We are being heard and we really appreciate that and thank all of you board members that are not able to continue on the board for the service that you've given. And I just wanna say, serving as chair for the last two years, that it's been an honor and a real joy to come represent this committee because it's, you know, there's such a level of commitment and responsibility here. And I will continue to serve on the committee and look forward to doing whatever I can to help enhance Metro service and advise all of you from the perspective of writers. And thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Veronica. And thank you for your many years of service on the MAC. It's really critical to us to have the kind of input that your organization gives us. Uh, we, the connection with our writers is much more direct through you, frankly, than directly to the board. And we appreciate, particularly for a disabled uh, 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 members of our community and, and other folks who might not be prepared to come to a board meeting and make a comment. We, we get important feedback from you about the services we provide and how they might be provided in a more effective way. Thank you. And people do come and find us and say stuff to us. So no, uh, it really does you. work that way. <laughs> Thank you. Are there any questions from members of the board? Okay. Thank you very much again, Veronica, for your service. We appreciate it. You have... You've left big shoes to fill here. <laughs> Thank you so much. Next, we have uh, Alex Clifford, our uh, CEO and general manager, is going to give us an update on COVID-19 uh, fiscal crisis and how we're responding. Yes, Mr. Chair. Um, so what I'll cover today is uh, a little bit about the uh, upcoming sequence of holidays. We have three holidays coming up in a row here. And as we know from prior statistics, in the 14 or so days following holidays, we tend to see the COVID numbers go up. So I'm really gonna focus on that and take advantage today of being able to speak to not only the board, but our employees, our union representatives and the public. Um, this is a very important time to be extra careful. As I've been making the rounds talking to our employees, I have tried to reinforce over and over again that they have done a great job. Statistically, the number of COVID cases that we've had at this agency on a per capita basis are below the county experience. So that tells you that our employees are doing something right. And so as we enter into the holiday season, my message has been don't be complacent. Don't take it for granted. Don't think that just because you have been lucky, you can start letting your guard down. Now's the time to double down. Um, this is a tough period of time that we're getting ready to enter into, and we want to come out on the other side somewhere around mid-January and be able to say, wow, we did a great job. Um, we stayed safe. So I'll just share a couple of messages today. Um, certainly, as uh, with Thanksgiving fastly approaching, um, people may be hosting gatherings. They may be attending gatherings. And so the CDC <laughs> uh, advises uh, when you're attending a gathering, bring your own food, drinks, plates, cups, and utensils. Wear a mask and safely store your mask while eating and drinking. Avoid going in and out of areas where food is being prepared or handled, such as in the kitchen. 
and use single use options like salad dressing, condiment packets, disposable items like food containers, plates, and utensils. Now, if you're not attending one, you may be hosting a, a gathering. And in that case, uh, the CDC recommends that you have small outdoor meal and family and friends who live in your community. Limit the number of guests, have conversations with guests ahead of time, to set your expectations of celebrating together, clean and disinfect frequently touched surfaces and items between use. If celebrating indoors, make sure to open windows, limit the number of people in food preparation areas, have guests bring their own food and drink, and if sharing food, have one person serve food and use single use options like plastic utensils. As we all know, on the 19th, the uh, governor issued uh, another limited stay at home order, which really put in place a curfew that starts this coming Saturday at 10 p.m. And it will apply going forward to any county that, uh, that is in the purple tier of the state rating system. That's us we, right now. That is us right now. <clears throat> so we, Rufus is in the process of reviewing that to see if there's anything we need to do different. But at this point, uh, we, we will continue to operate service beyond 10 p.m. because people who are associated with essential services um, will still need to be able to travel on our system. So we don't, we don't expect, at least at this point, subject to further review that we'll need to terminate service at 10 p.m. We'll still need to be there for people who need us. Also, I thought it was interesting in looking at the state website, um, State Health and Human Services Agency, on November 13, they posted some really interesting information. And something that people don't always think about is, uh, and I'll just read from their document, a person with COVID goes on to infect two to four people or what they say is an average of 2.5 people. So for example, if each infected person spreads the virus to two people, who in turn spread it to two other people, those four will spread the virus to eight others, those eight spread it to 16, and so on. So as a result, after 10 of those transmission cycles, one person could be responsible for 1,024 other people contracting the virus. Um, important to think about. Um, the state also has, in that same document, says recommendations and mandatory, mandatory requirements for all gatherings. Uh, attendance, <clears throat> gatherings that include more than three households are prohibited. So the state, much more strict than CDC. Um, location, gatherings must be outdoors for counties in the purple tier, must be outdoors. All gatherings must be held outside in the purple tier and indoor gatherings are strongly discouraged in the red, orange, and yellow tiers. Tip consistent with all of our advice for employees, customers, don't attend gatherings if you feel sick. Individuals in a high-risk group are discouraged from attending any gatherings. I practice physical distancing and hand hygiene when at gatherings. Wear a face covering to keep COVID from spreading. Keep it short. Gatherings should be two hours or less. The longer the duration, the risk of transmission increases. Singing, chanting, shouting, cheering, and similar activities are strongly discouraged at outdoor gatherings and prohibited at indoor gatherings. Prohibited. So, Mr. Chair, I wanted to take this spot in our agenda to convey that information to get everyone to recommit and to double down, uh, whether you're a board member, community member listening, or an employee, double down in the next two months to be really extraordinarily safe. Think about it. Um, you know, you're playing with fire if you're not, if you're not listening to these guidance. Um, not only do you put yourself in jeopardy, you put your family members in jeopardy. And if by chance you contract it and come to work, you put your fellow employees in jeopardy. So to all who are listening, great job for what you've done. Keep doing a great job and uh, we'll get through the holidays. Uh, Alex, let me add that CDC's most recent advice, it's not a requirement, but advice is that people make the difficult decision. I had to make it 
my family had to make it this year, not to invite guests outside of your immediate family. I mean, traditionally at Thanksgiving, we bring friends and other people, particularly if they don't have other families they're having Thanksgiving with. And that's, you know, a big part of the holiday and stuff. And we've just decided that's not great as an idea, not only for us, but for the, the people, you know, and it's not just the people that come to the dinner, as you pointed out, it's the people you go back home to, people who may even be more vulnerable. They, they might not have showed up, but if one of somebody from their family shows up, brings it back to them, there's a problem. So they advise against travel on Thanksgiving, which is another, it's the heaviest travel day of the year. And one of them anyway. And, uh, so they advise against traveling to Thanksgiving events and they advise against having multiple family Thanksgiving dinners. And so that's a hard thing to swallow on some level, but I think it's good advice to pay attention to it. Agreed. Any other questions of Alex about the district and the COVID issues and responses? John Leopold. Well, uh, thanks for the report. You know, uh, as we watch the COVID numbers, we seen that every time we get a little bit better, it gets a little bit worse. And we're really going to be challenged over the next couple of weeks. Um, but I appreciate all the efforts that have gone forward to make it safe for people to still ride the buses, um, for employees to be safe. And I think we're going to have to continue to double down on that in, in, the, uh, um, in the coming year, because even with the news of the vaccine coming, it's, it will be uh, as long as a year before um, everyone can actually access this. So th this is this is our way of life for uh, for uh, 2021 as well as 2020, and so we just have to adopt these practices uh, in order to make it safe for people to ride on our transit. Thanks. Thanks, John. Any other comments or questions? Okay. Next, we're going to have our uh, general CEO's oral report. Alex has that as well. Okay. Yes, uh, Mr. Chair, directors, a number of reports for you, but. First, I thought I would go off agenda and just have some friendly competition with Trina Gomez. That's my <laughs> new grandson born yesterday morning. Oh, Maxwell. All right. So Maxwell will uh, is born in a year that we will never forget. Um, marked by all the challenges we just talked about. Uh, yeah. COVID healthy, babies. That's right. Healthy baby and mom is doing well too. Uh, so on to my report, and I just want to acknowledge uh, under promotions and new hires, we had an internal promotion, um, Maria Vicky Sanchez, who was formerly our customer service representative, has been promoted to customer service assistant, uh, effective on October 29th. So congratulations to Vicky for that promotion. Uh, also want to note, as I think the chair will clarify towards the end of our agenda, that uh, I don't see a need for us to have a December meeting. And if you would like to do what you have done in past years and and go dark in December, we can do that. Um, I do want to take just a quick moment to um, acknowledge John Leopold, Supervisor Leopold, and the working relationship that we've had. Uh, I will tell you that when I came aboard, um, and we had this fiscal crisis, this huge structural deficit, this impending fiscal cliff. Um, John brought his financial and budgetary expertise to the table and helped us greatly in navigating our way through that process and to the ultimate solutions that helped to save the agency. Um, I will tell you also that over the years, John has been really important to me in this agency's relationship with our unions from time to time. Uh, we've had scuffles between the CEO and, and some of our union reps. And when you have these scuffles, you have a breakdown in communication. And John has been there to, to be a, a valuable conduit to help, help break that log jam. When you have a log jam, the two sides are not communicating. And that conduit between the two has helped to get us through numerous challenges, whether they be little here and there scuffles or negotiations uh, uh, relative to the contract. Um, and, and you know, he, he, what I really appreciate too is that John has, you know, when one side calls John, John doesn't just run with that. John looks for both sides. What do, what do both sides have to say about a particular thing? And then offers his counsel. Um, John, I will miss that. It's been over six years of a, a really wonderful relationship. Um, I'm extraordinarily sad to see you go. Thank you, Alex, and I appreciate your dedication uh, to the transit district. It's been really great. 
Appreciate that. Uh, on to the uh, report that's just hot off the press. Our monthly sales tax numbers came in. This, now this is just for the 1979 half cent sales tax. Um, this represents uh, the sales tax on taxable items for the month of September. Um, and so just to, in the way, way of brief background, you, you know from previous reports that now four of the five months in the current fiscal year have come in over what our budget is. Well, it happened again. I, I thought we'd go to the other side this month, um, but that was not the case. Our actual was 1,533,324. Budget was 1,509,512. That's about just shy of $24,000 to the favorable on the half cent sales tax. So that's still good news. Still, hope, and all of this is so important to that uh, you know likely impending fiscal crisis from from COVID. Um, you, you know, we're not getting as many revenues from the fare box, so we're suffering every month there. And then, of course, as the economy continues to flounder as a, as a result of COVID, uh, we can expect other economic dependent revenues to drop. So the more we can bank now to help us get through a longer period of time um, and hopefully not have to cross a furlough and layoff bridge, the better we are. So we're really thankful for uh, those numbers continuing to look uh, favorable for us. My final report has to do with uh, the federal side of the business. I don't have much to report on the state side. We've completed that cycle. But as you know, we have a number of important transit items pending in the, the federal government side. Um, I do want to point out that uh, uh, um, President-elect Biden has appointed a 18-member uh, transition team to review the DOT, Department of Transportation, FTA, and FRA fall under those, under the DOT. That's federal and, administration, and what was the third one? The, the DOT, the, the federal, federal and, and the, uh, the, the FTA, Federal Transit Association, Transportation Association, where, where we get our funding from. Um, so, and Phil Washington, who is the CEO of LA Metro down south, is the lead of that. Um, some speculate that he is potentially uh, being considered to be uh, the, the, the new administrator of the DOT. So that'll be interesting to see. But his job is to review the DOT. Now, this is highways, this is rail, this is bus, right? All under the DOT. And to make recommendations to the transition team about what uh, needs to be fixed, changed. So that, that's an interesting um, person to have involved in that. Um, strong, strong transit history. And um, we'll see how, how uh, that shakes itself out. Uh, you also probably heard that on September 30th, there was a continuing resolution so that uh, the federal government could continue to fund um, entities that are dependent on it like us, and also a, a FAST Act extension. So the FAST Act was extended for one year, so now Congress has up to a year at, at prior baseline funding levels to decide what they want to do, create a new FAST Act or, or continue it and just add more money to it. And then the continuing resolution for the FY21 funding is uh, through December 11th, so they'll have to get to work on that rather rapidly. Uh, on that note, you have two recommendations, one from the Senate Transportation, Housing, and Urban Development. Sometimes we refer that as the THUD, and another from the House. Um, and we have been dependent now for the last two years in Congress taking the baseline funding that's in the FAST Act, and we use the term plus up. They've added money to it in the different categories, 5307 formula, bus and bus facilities, low no grants. They've said, we'll take the baseline, what the law says, and we'll add some additional money to it because we recognize, um, even pre-COVID, they recognize the need for transit to be funded at a greater amount. So in the November 10th <coughs> Senate version, uh, they are offering a total of $571 million in plus-ups, whereas the August House version is about $499 million. So they're not far apart. And as you know, when you when you the House and the Senate now have to go through a reconciliation process and come to an agreement. 
Um, there are some within those numbers, even though the big number doesn't sound like they're too far apart, within the numbers there are some deviations. <clears throat> For example, on the bus and bus facilities program, uh, which we have been awarded buses previously, uh, the Senate is a plus up of 223 million, whereas the House is a plus up of 374. On the LONO program, which we have a 2016 grant for three electric over the road coaches for Highway 17, for example, um, the Senate plus up is 80 million and the House is 125 million. On the 5339A formula, we depend on that amount. We get a little uh, close to half a million dollars a year that we put into all sorts of much smaller capital needs in this agency. On the Senate side, they have a 223 million plus up, whereas the House had nothing to plus up. And then on the 5311, which is the rural program, we get some 5311 money because we do have some rural areas in Santa Cruz County. There's a plus up on the Senate side of 45 million and zero on the House. So they need to go through a reconciliation and we'll keep advocating through our um, lobbyists, federal lobbyists for our, our hopes and aspirations there. Then on to the CARES Act, what I call CARES Act 2. It's called any number of things, but basically it's a second round of transit emergency relief funding. As you know, through CARES Act 1, which was a $25 billion uh, transit emergency funding across the nation, we received 20 million, so that's pretty substantial and important to us and helping to keep us afloat. APTA is jumping right in and, and talking to the president's, uh, president-elect's uh, transition team, pushing for the House's version, which was the House had a HEROES Act, which we really, really hated because we thought it, it sent all the money to the, to the large properties. Then the House revisited that and came up with HEROES II, and HEROES II did a little bit better job, um, but there's still aspects of it that we have issues with. Um, so in Heroes 2, the, the House is at least proposing $32 billion uh, for, the, for the transit emergency relief. They would break that down. I'll just hit the three biggest components. They would break that down as $18.5 billion for formula. So it would be distributed much the same as the CARES Act was. So, uh, for example, in CARES Act, again, $25 billion transit emergency relief, we got $20 million. Uh, theoretically, with an 18.5 billion, we, we would get a proportionate share of that. Um, the part that we have an issue with is that uh, still a big chunk, 10 billion, emer goes to the emergency relief grants program that the FTA um, manages. And that's problematic for us because that really, for the most part, will exclude small to mid-sized transit agencies and will target large agencies. Um, so our position has been that all of that funding, in, in effect, 28.5 billion, should be distributed through the uh, formula programs, and that's the fair thing to do, and that's the fair thing that was done in CARES Act One. So we'll continue advocating for that, um, in agreement with APTA on the 32 billion, in disagreement with them on those that that distinction. And then finally, if you've had a chance to look at uh, President-elect Biden's climate change proposal. Uh, he does mention transit in there, but we do have some work to advocate, uh, hopefully through his transition team before they put anything in stone. He, he is he, he, he's paying attention to cities of 100,000 or more in which he wants to focus on zero emissions public transit. Um, we'd like to encourage him to broaden his thinking to, to, to transit in general and not just focus on cities of 100,000 or more. So if you have forums with any of the people on the transition team, uh, please mention that uh, they should consider small transit agencies and medium-sized transit agencies in their transit program. And Mr. Chair, that concludes my report. Thank you very much for that, Alex. Are there questions of Alex on his report? I see none. Um, Mr. Chair. Uh, please. We've had uh, some very successful visits to D.C. in the past, and uh, do you see that there's any need at this point for us to try to make contact with some folks? And I, Mr. Gilio will let us know who those people are. Uh, is there any, should we be um, making our voice heard back there uh, at this point, uh, do you think? I mean, we have a new administration, whether they like, some people like it or not. Uh, so I just was wondering if we should take a formal action or 
try to contact those about some of the points that you made that are so important to Metro um, in, in light of our not being able to go back to DC, which has been very successful in the past. Was your question yeah. whether would the district might send uh, information to the cities and the county that would allow them to support our concerns? Is that yeah, I think so. And then they contact the uh, members of Congress about what are, what are the concerns of Metro. Uh, That's to you, Alex. Yes, so um, Chris and I talk about every other week, uh, trying to keep track of what's going on and, and what we can do to influence that process. Uh, he has a standing item that if there is an opportunity to get the right people into a Zoom meeting, um, we won't be making any trips obviously back to DC in the near future, but if we can get them into a Zoom meeting uh, and then we would again have our board contingency participate in that, we will do that. So we're watching for that opportunity. In the meantime, uh, Chris is continuing to actively work on our behalf to get our message through. And just this week, he, he finished in collaboration with our planning department uh, a letter that, that I signed and we sent to our representatives, Congresswoman Eshu and Congressman Panetta, um, to advocate uh, for uh, both the formula program for any new relief money and for a, a strong new uh, or a strong FY21 appropriations with these plus ups and how much we need those. So we'll keep hitting hard with these communication letters to the various um, key staff, key elected officials. And as soon as we can find that right forum where we can get together in a Zoom meeting, we'll put that together. And, and you should uh, look for opportunities to let the various agencies in our county know uh, how they can help support us because transportation is a key issue in many, many of the, in fact, I would say in every one of our jurisdictions. And so they may well wish to like have us address that or help us address that at the federal level. Thank you. Um, done with that item, unless uh, any questions any further? Yes. Yes, Simply. someone has one. Who is uh, that? Sorry. I think probably most people on the, most people in this meeting know, but Zach was really involved with the Biden campaign. He was um, part of the Biden communications team, regular, regular. Um, um, part of their meetings and so forth. So he may have, Zach friend for those that don't yeah, know. Yeah. He may, there, if you haven't already pursued this, he may well have some relationships, insights, etc., that could be useful to Alex, you, or the lobbyists. <laughs> Work them. <laughs> Thanks, Cynthia. Yeah. Any other comments? Okay. Our next item is uh, to accept and file the year-to-date key performance indicators. Our, our board has been very good uh, and had very good control over the financial aspects of running this uh, agency. On the other hand, the, the question of knowing how the uh, agency runs day-to-day, -day, we're not supposed to micromanage that. We have management people to do that and, and the employees of the district in general. But we now have some uh, indicators that will allow us, I think, to stay more on top of how we're doing as an agency in terms of how the service we provide actually operates. We've, we've had that some indicators in the past, but I think we've really uh, it, uh, improved those indicators. So we're in a much better position as we go forward to try and make sure that we understand how our agency is doing in not just financial terms, but in terms of other kinds of key indicators. So this uh, item is... Um, being uh, presented, is Angela here today? I didn't see her on the call. Mr. Chair, Angela is out. So Christina, our uh, deputy finance uh, director will be presenting the report. Good morning, Christina. Good morning, Chair, board members, staff members and public. So I will provide you with a very brief overview of the KPIs for the first quarter of fiscal year 21. And we have data for the month of July, August and September. So this time, we have our presentations. We selected five main categories, financial performance, productivity, risk management and safety, reliability and dependability. And I will start with the financial performance, this um, presentation and our analysis, is basically a joint effort between finance and multiple departments, planning, risk management, operations and maintenance. So with the financial performance, normally those are widely used KPIs by most transit agencies, primarily because of NTD requirements, but also because we analyze those on a daily basis, monthly basis due to budgeting process. We wanna make sure that we're using our resources um, and effectively and efficiently. 
And under financial performance, primarily we are focused on the system fair box recovery ratio. And this time we presented our we prepared our presentation a little bit differently. We want to show you definition and the description of the metric, the importance, and also the current status. So fair box recovery, it's uh, basically a ratio of past and fares to our operating costs. And as you can see, since March and then April and in June, um, it declined significantly. And, and the reason here, as we all know, is COVID-19. As we resume fair collections at the end of June, we can see that in July, August, and September, fair box recovery started climbing up slightly. And hopefully this trend will continue. Our average KPI, and this is for the whole system, it's around 20%, 20, 21, 21%. Usually fixed routes have KPIs of around 20, commuters are significantly higher. It's usually 40, 45, and then in characters, of course, that number is significantly uh, lower between five and 6%. Uh, next slide, please. The next KPI in finance, it's the fixed route commuter cost per revenue service hour. And this is basically a measure of um, efficiency and we want to me make sure that we are using our resources effectively and we can minimize costs. So what's important to, to notice here is that fluctuations in the cost per, per revenue service hours are very typical from month to month. The average cost, however, is what we should be concerned about. And the average cost for fiscal year 19 was around $200, $212. In 2021, that cost is significantly higher and COVID, um, it, it's, it's the main reason for that, of course, in, especially in fiscal year 20. In the months of July and August, as you can see, especially in July, we have a very significant increase. And what happens normally in July, what happened last year and also this year, we usually prepay the PERS UIL, which is the unfunded accrued liability. And when that happens, our expenses are significantly higher. At the same time, this year specifically, we kind of had the perfect storm because our revenue service hours are lower. And so therefore the cost, it's, it's much higher. I could just expand that for a moment for members of the public. The, <clears throat> we have a cost for our pension, ongoing pension costs. And if we pay them up front or earlier, we actually save a great deal of money. And that's the payment that she's talking about in terms of the early payment. Uh, for people to understand that the, per, the PERS is our retirement system and we're making early payments of a, a debt we will owe at some point and by paying it earlier we the interest costs and other costs go down and we save money doing it and that's why that pink bar is so high in that chart that we're looking at thank you mac that's correct so the, un the unfunded liability this year was um more than 4 million, 4.4 million. But by prepaying that amount early in July, we saved approximately $150,000 for the whole year. So those are significant savings. And we will continue doing so as much as possible. Next slide, please. So the Paracruise cost per trip essentially provides the same information, but for Paracruise. And um, in July, you can see the dramatic effect of uh, the unfunded liability the same prepayment that we just discussed about. In addition to that, we uh, reduced our revenue service hours in order to respond to the pandemic and our costs are significantly higher as well. Next slide, please. So the next section of our presentation is productivity and planning could probably provide additional information for our total ridership, ridership per hour, as well as ridership for Highway 17, UCC, Cabrillo and local ridership. If John's available, he'll probably add additional details to this. Uh, sure. I mean, as we've been discussing throughout this period, ridership is down about 80%, uh, both in terms of total ridership and uh, productivity. You know, normally in productivity, we're at about 25 to 30 passengers per revenue hour when uh, UCSC and Cabrillo are in session and 15 to 20 outside of that. And obviously, we've, we've been kind of below 10 uh, throughout all this, this period. Next slide, please. Similar stats for UCSC ridership at Cabrillo, you know, with school not in session or in-person classes not in session, obviously ridership has been way, way down, as we've discussed. And at the end, our local ridership on the next slide, as well as Highway 17 ridership, uh, pretty much tell the same story. Yep. And that's, that's a combination of uh, 
many things, but largely uh, people in the Silicon Valley who are now working from home and not taking that service and San Jose State University, which is uh, having a lot of remote, mostly remote classes. And so that's that's our ridership from that, from that round, but primarily, and it's dropped very dramatically, just as UCSC, which usually has 19,000 students, only has a thousand, half of whom live on campus, but almost all of them were in town using the service to get to classes. And now we're down to a thousand students who actually are living on campus and the number who are in Santa Cruz is higher, but it's, I have a student, I'm teaching a class this quarter of students who comes to class from China every morning. <laughs> That's a long commute. The, uh, yeah, our, our 2019 uh, Highway 17 ridership found that about 30% of uh, commuters are, or 30% of riders are commuters, 30% are students, and about 25% is recreational. And so all of that have been down, but particularly the students and commuters have just been wiped out entirely. And I think the next slide is the local. Um, and here's here's where we see the strongest ridership. So there is still core a core group of riders on our system. Um, it could be essential workers or people accessing essential services, but it, it goes to show that uh, maintaining the network is critically important for still 35% of, of passengers on our system. And I think finally on the ridership, uh, this is looking at uh, passengers per revenue service hour by route. Um, the 91X is a, obviously the commuter express service between Watsonville and Santa Cruz. It's strong because there are limited trips, but um, there are people relying on particularly the, or, the an early morning trip. Um, and then we've seen kind of our, the, you know, the core of our network, the 69, A&W, 71, uh, 66, uh, having the strongest productivity. Um, and we see the impact of um, minimal UCSC ridership on traditionally routes that have the highest productivity, the 20, the 16, the 10, et cetera. Okay, our next category is uh, on the risk management and safety, and we have a few metrics here to discuss. So the first one is the traffic accidents, and will be presented by Rufus, our um, risk management director. Good morning, board chair, board members, and public. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we hear you. Yes, thank you. So this chart, uh, what we have created, uh, it summarizes almost all traffic accidents and categorized as loading zone accident, that means in the bus stops, bicyclist accidents, intersection, that, that means in the intersection, incidents happening. Between intersection means between intersection, those accidents happening. Then it's a rear end vehicle accidents, and then others, and district vehicle accidents and pedestrians. So we look at the highest peak numbers where we are, and try to figure out what's going on there, what kind of these accidents and how they are occurring. So in the loading zone or bus stop accident, we found that out of 14, the highest number, there were 12 accidents with other vehicles hitting metro bus or metro vehicle. There were two where the metro vehicle made contact. Uh, and the bicycles, there were two, one in each uh, fiscal year 19 and 20, and in both of these incidents, the bicyclist lost control and made contact with the bus. These were very minor, nothing, no major, no hospitalization involved in that. Next one, intersections, the highest number was 17. Out of that, 15 were the other vehicles that hit the metro vehicle, and the two were metro vehicle made contact with the vehicle. Between intersections, we had 38 and 32 were other vehicle hitting metro vehicle, metro bus, and six way metro vehicle made contact. For rear end, 23 accident out of 25, there are other vehicles hitting metro vehicle, and there were two where metro vehicle made the contact. In the other category, 53, where metro had hit a fixed object. The fixed object is usually uh, is at the bus stop where there's a pole very close to it, a bus stop or where the sign is posted very close to the bus stop 
or where a tree or tree branch is very close to the bus stop and our bus has made contact with them. Between district vehicles, the highest number 14, which were very minor, mirror to mirror, uh, or backing up, made contact with each other. And in the pedestrian category, we have one in fiscal year 19 and one in 20, and both were uh, very minor. The pedestrian was uh, kind of uh, playing at the bus stop and hit his shoulder as the bus was pulling into the stop. And the second one was pedestrian. He had his bike, he loaded his bike on the bike rack and he turned and hit his head at the, the mirror uh, or the curve side. Uh, that was also very minor. Next slide, please. Okay, before you move on, let me just point out, just so it's clear, lest I misunderstand, at the finance committee meeting, we looked at this and it looks like we, oh, we're doing so well in, in 2000, in our fiscal year 2021, 20, uh, look how much fewer accidents we're having, but this is only to date. And so it might be helpful with a slide in the future mm -hmm. to present a slide that compares, you know, comparable peer time periods in the first period of each of these years, uh, maybe in addition, or at least Without that, otherwise, it's very misleading. It sort of looks like we're doing, oh, we're so much better off. Maybe <laughs> we, we, we won't. If it actually looks, if you look proportionally, we are a little better off. We're doing better. But to get a better sense of it, to compare uh, comparable time periods, I think would be helpful to the board. Yeah, yes. next uh, uh, time when we present, I, we took note of that comment, <clears throat> like a quarterly comparison, so that we are uh, comparable in those quarters, how well or how bad we are doing. So yeah, we have taken that note and we will work on that chart next time when we present this information. Yeah, two things on that real quick, Rufus. One is by doing what the committee suggested, we'll actually be able to see seasonality. You know, yeah. in the wet season, you might see a different type of accident pattern than in a drier season. In addition to that, we're gonna try to add some data that shows chargeability, that is, was it our fault or was it the other individual's fault? Yeah, we'll do that. I have made those notes and, and we will do that. Any more questions? Otherwise, next slide, please. So in this, what we have done, uh, we have broken the types of uh, passenger accidents. Uh, while they are boarding the bus, uh, they have that many accidents while alighting from the bus that shows that many accidents. And same thing, while they are on the bus, on board, they have these many accidents. Oh, we looked at this thing and we were working uh, and developed a trifold brochure, which looks like this, if you can see. Uh, and this brochure tells how to safely board the bus and how to safely alight from the bus, and while they are on the bus, how they can prevent uh, falling in the bus. And this brochure has been put as take one in all the buses. Uh, we, I'm also working with transportation training department to, uh, to come up with kind of training instructions for the bus operators to make sure that when they are pulling or pulling out of the bus stop or driving, uh, be careful of abrupt braking or hard braking or what are the, the movements we do to prevent uh, onboard injuries on the bus. So with the education to the passengers and education to our bus operators, hopefully we can reduce or make a difference in the coming months and years. Thank you, Rufus. Uh, our next category, it's reliability. And it's uh, basically the metric here. It's the mean mass between chargeable road poles for fixed route. And we'll also present uh, the same for Highway 17. And this is normally a good indicator of the maintenance program at Metro, the age of the fleet and uh, the state of good repair. So um, Eddie Benson, our maintenance manager, could provide a little information about the current status for uh, fixed route first and then for Highway 17 as well. I think he was available earlier. He was on the call. He may be muted. Well, I could probably just start by saying that um, 
usually higher miles where when those bars are going higher and higher, that's a positive indicator because that essentially means that we have uh, less uh, mechanical failures. And usually Highway 17 is where we see a better performance. Uh, fixed route is a little bit lower, but it's still a pretty good indication of um, the maintenance program, the efficiency of that program, as well as the age of the fleet. You could expect uh, more calls during the winter time. So this is also a good KPI that could show you the, the seasonal fluctuations um, depending on the weather, depending on road conditions, et cetera. Um, thank you, Christina. This is Margo. Um, thank you, Margo. I'd like to add to it. Um, also, um, we saw lower mileage, obviously, because of the uh, decreased ridership. Um, yeah. But the overall mileage between chargeable road calls has improved um, overall um, due to the maintenance program, our PMI program, and in our campaigns that we do. Uh, we did see an uh, increase in um, our miles between roll calls in paracruz, but I think that will be taken care of uh, when we get our seven new uh, uh, bands online. Um, and with that, I'll take any questions. Are there any questions? Okay, Margaret, where are we? Thank you both. Thank you. Next slide, please. Uh, so we have the same information here for Highway 17, and the next slide will present the same for Paracruz as well. And with that, we could go into the category of dependability. And this is important because it allows us to see the reasons behind cancel trips uh, by location, by, uh, by cause. And so I think Margot could present a little bit more about what happened in the first quarter between the months of July and September of 21, of fiscal year 21. Um, so as everyone has been aware, we had a number of fires uh, in August. Um, and the cancellations were due to those fires, especially in San Lorenzo Valley. Uh, um, due to the CZU lightning fire, um, the operators did an outstanding job in, in you know, assisting um, the first responders and getting folks out and, and helping as much as they could. Um, um, just a well-prepared um, um, group of folks that assisted us. Um, and for the, the portion of the, um, where we had to cancel trips, um, in the Cabrillo and South County area, um, Metro decided to restrict the overtime for bus operators. Um, one reason was due to the lack of personnel. Uh, obviously we had a lot of um, um, members out due to COVID-19 and, and the school closures and fires for many, many reasons. And with that, um, we restricted the overtime and also we asked the dispatchers to be very careful in the trips were, that were canceled. Um, they were usually trips that were not long in length. Um, we did not cancel service that ran every hour. Um, we tried to make those um, certainly. Um, we also um, made sure that we did not can cancel trips that were the last trip. Um, we uh, you know, were high priority um, and making sure that when we did cancel trips, there was a, a bus, you know, 15 or 30 minutes behind um, that canceled trip. Um, hopefully with the new bid, we'll see a larger extra board. Um, we're looking at between 40 and 50%, and that should reduce um, our cancellation of open assignments. And with that, I'll be glad to take any questions. Other questions? Okay, thank you. Um, I have a comment generally. Um, I think it would be helpful to us to have some, not, not every report on every one of these statistics or, or these uh, um, indicators, but to have some comparison with national, not just general national numbers, but with comparable districts. It's always been helpful to me, for example, if you take um, the percentage of our uh, finances that come from ridership. Uh, you know, when I first got on the transit board, this is a long time ago, 1979, I saw that we were at that time, I think had about 20% re recovery, you know, came from uh, the, was the rider, the riders were paying 20% of the cost of a bus ride. And I was shocked. And so 20%, that's, you know, what a low number and stuff. Turns out at the time better than the national average by quite a bit. Um, and that's continued to be the case. 
And I think it would be helpful to the board to be able to understand on some of these statistics, how do we compare in terms of the kinds of accidents we have and, and every one of these metrics. Um, and again, not necessarily every time in every report, but at least maybe once a year or something, give us an annual comparison number because how else do you know whether what we're doing is, you know, out of line with what the industry generally, you know, how many, how many people, I mean, there's all these examples of people running into us in accidents. Um, is there something we could be, you know, is that shocking in terms of what the national situation is or, or comparable situation or is that, you know, um, basically what's be expected in terms of the way traffic accidents happen in the industry and so forth. So if that's something we could develop, I mean, we could work with this in the finance committee in terms of getting feedback on it, but I think it'd be helpful to see those kinds of metrics as well. Yeah, Mr. Chair, I think um, I'm glad you, you said what you said earlier, maybe once a year. It, it's very difficult data to assemble when you're trying to compare to peers. You like, can't always use the NTD data and, and the problem with NTD data a national transit database, which we submit to the FTA. The problem with that is it's two year lagging data. So we're trying to compare today's number to two year, two year old data. So that doesn't work. So that it takes a great deal of staff time to call each of the peer agencies and get their, their, their maybe, uh, updated numbers. Maybe even every other year, but I mean, at some point to have a benchmark to sort of know how we're doing, I think would be helpful. Oh, I think annual is a good, good way to go. I think we can do it annually. Thank you. Any other comments or responses from members of the board? Uh, Alta. I just have a quick comment and I would like for it to be edited um, in some regards, but whenever you can say uh, the ridership is down due to um, enrollment, I would love for you to say limited um, enrollment or in-person courses because our students tend to want to appeal saying we don't have the bus and we do, and we offer it for our folks to get around the community. As long as they're a student, they get the pass. So I don't want any language that kind of misleads our folks in thinking we're paying for something we're not getting because I get those appeals. <laughs> well, that's good advice to our staff. So we'll, we'll try, and try and follow that. You can say reduced in-person courses or a, a limited, <laughs> that would be very helpful. <laughs> yes, no, I'm sure that's the case. Thank you for that. That's a useful comment. Any other questions or comments? Okay, our last item on today's agenda is, um, do, we, do we need to, by the way, do we need to vote to accept that report or can we just, we heard it, accept it and without a vote by consensus, let's say? I think that's fine. Thank you, appreciate that, Julie. Uh, our next and final item is the review and file of Judy K. Sousa Electric Vehicle Charging Infrastructure Project Closeout Report. Okay, so, so uh, the charging infrastructure um, was completed on time and will be ready for when Metro uh, receives this four first electric buses in early 2021. Um, the project was completed below budget and remaining the funds uh, with the one-time carryover funds will actually return to capital reserve. Um, and this uh, slideshow will basically show you the, the progress of, of a the infrastructure from start to, from start of construction to completion. And and uh, if you have any questions, or we can just go straight to the slideshow. Well, let's go to the slideshow. Yes. So and on that and that slideshow it shows uh, the first stage of uh, you know concrete removal demolition. And next slideshow. And again, we continue removing. Uh, concrete and, and then it comes to excavation in the next slideshow. So, so on this on this slideshow, it will actually show you that we, uh, on one of the changes we had to do, um, we had to run in uh, the conduits inside uh, the property or Metro's side property. And it was a little bit increased cost uh, uh, having to do this. Uh, next slideshow. And there it goes, starts uh, again, it's excavating and putting uh, uh, the vault in. The vault, as you can see right there, uh, that was another vault uh, that we had to change. pg &E requested a, a, a bigger vault uh, to be exchanged and, uh, and that cost, a, cost another increase in cost. Next slide show. And here we go again, we're continuing more progressing. Next slide show. 
and that's underground. That's all the conduit, all the piping. That, as you can see, it's quite a, a lot of a conduit that went underground. And there it starts getting covered up. And as you can see, we got rain, and even with the rain, uh, progress didn't stop. We continued working. Uh, to, we got pretty lucky, and we were able to complete this. Next slide, Sean. And then you start seeing here, uh, we, st we start having the, some of the, um, um, basically the, the location where the charges were gonna be mounted and the transformers. Next slide, Sean. And more completion, concrete poured in, uh, almost at the finishing stages. Um, next slide, Sean. And there you go, the, every, everything starts start coming into place. Uh, you got the, uh, all the cabinets coming in, the charges coming in. Next slide, Sean. And that's pretty, pretty much uh, completion right there. Uh, it's everything that's been operational and in place. Um, Maybe people can't see in this, they're, they're at, along the fence line there, there's a bunch of the actual chargers in front of each of those buses that the buses plug into to be charged up. Yep, and uh, we'll show you right now in the next slide show actually whether uh, uh, those are the chargers, the actual charge, and then the, the next slide show. And there, there is actually the, the dispensers. These are were actually connected onto the wall, which are where we would be connecting the buses to. And there's another picture of different angle of the charging infrastructure. Any questions? Are there questions? My only question is uh, what progress, if any, are we making in dealing with community power um, about the possibility of getting lower rates for the charging of buses than say the general public receives at their homes or something? I know that's not happening overnight. They're consider it's under consideration and there's discussions, but where are we at in that process, if at all? Okay, uh, PG&E recently released uh, a commercial um, e electrical vehicle uh, plan. So we're currently working with CTE, which uh, we're gonna subscribe to a, a block of energy. Um, so we have to basically at the beginning of the, of, of the year of when we first uh, initiate start charging, we will, go, we will um, uh, subscribe to a block and, and basically we're buying the electricity beforehand. And okay. And so that's kind of, that's where the plan is going to, and it was recently released uh, a couple months ago. PG released that. Well, it, uh, uh, Chair, this is John Leopold. Uh, this is really exciting seeing this move forward as we move to, to our eventual goal of, uh, of having an all electric uh, fleet. And it's interesting, the idea of purchasing the energy upfront is sort of like what we do for uh, uh, gas. Right, you know, we purchased at the beginning, and then we, then we always uh, look to see whether we're doing better than than uh, what's going on. But the the idea that we're actually starting to build out this infrastructure to be able to support this uh, direction to be zero emission is really fantastic, and I appreciate the work of the staff to make that happen. I even got a chance to plug in when I was there a couple weeks ago. <laughs> You're here. Well, uh, well, let me explain a little bit. Uh, we're not actually purchasing the electricity up front. It's it's a subscription. So we're actually subscribing to, to it. If we don't use it, um, the, the first year is gonna be a trial period. So if, if we don't use all the electricity, we, we will get a break. Okay, but, 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 but if, if it, you know, coming the second year, we have to be a little bit more accurate on the, on the numbers of electricity that we're using. Fair enough. Thank Great. you. Are there any other questions? Hi, thank Good. you. Um, this was a really great little report. <laughs> <laughs> Very accessible um, and and dramatic with the photos. Um, this is something that's of great interest to the public, and um, you know, board members all know, um, particularly those who are really focused on climate action, want every every entity to switch to electric yesterday, um, and we all know that that has challenges. But this is a really impressive. Um, achievement right here. So I would say this this is a really good story. Um, with the photos shown over time, however you want to implement that. But um, I think it really shows, you know, we've, we've made the commitment, <laughs> we've gone out and gotten funding, it's been implemented, it's happening, 
it's a it's a nice complete story to to go out and tell the public, and one I think that would be really very well received. Um, the only other question I had Mike's question kind of in mind, but you know what ultimately does the savings in greenhouse gases and cost per mile? You know that's kind of the other part of the story. So, but anyway, this is a very nice little discreet presentation. And, and Chairman uh, Rocky, uh, just a brief yes. question. Uh, yeah, this is very exciting. And uh, I can just tell you that Central Coast Community Energy is very interested on public transportation issues. Uh, we have uh, uh, doing some school districts and getting some electric buses and so forth. So uh, this is a serious, serious uh, or top of the list uh, component of what we want to do for public transportation in Central Coast Community Energy too. So. Uh, uh, I think this is fantastic. I think it's a great advancement for us and for our entire community related to climate change. Thanks for those comments, Bruce. I'm sure we all subscribe to them. Any, uh, Tina. Um, yeah, I'll concur with what Bruce has had to say because um, working with the community, um, Central Coast Community Energy is, is going to benefit the Metro. Um, a couple questions I have is how long did it take for you to get through the process with PG&E? That's the first question I have because sometimes that's long and arduous. Yes. And I, 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 the other one is yours. Your, I'll have you answer that one first. Uh, yes, it was a it, it was a back and forth struggle uh, going to PG&E. It did take us a, a, a quite a few months to to go back and forth. Even even as the the project was going as progressing, it, we was we still had a couple setbacks while while construction. So it it like I said, but luckily we were able to get it done on time and before the buses uh, arrived. You you had mentioned that we were under budget, but in your presentation you showed that there were things that cost us more money. How did were we able to trim the corner and still keep this under budget with those costs that were increased? Okay. Um, at one point, um, uh, the board approved a, a three hundred thousand dollars from a one-time carryover funds. So, so, uh, and that was to, to like, like I said, more of a contingency fund in case we ran into other issues. So now on this report, um, those those funds that are actually remaining will go back to capital reserves, and hopefully in the future we can come back to you to the board and present you another level two possible uh, infrastructure charges. Well, my, my last question is the, the energy procurement. Um, you're, you're talking about procuring the electricity that comes from PG&E. Um, have you been able to compare uh, the possibility of the, the CCCE um, for the, the cost of the electricity through the CCA that we have? I, I know that these are beneficial projects that they're really wanting to um, invest in our community and maybe there's a better incentive in terms of the cost of the electricity uh, working through the CCA rather than PG&E for the electricity. Yep. Has that been evaluated? Let me jump in on that one. Yeah, so we did meet with their executive director about a year ago. Um, they didn't have any special rates to offer. Um, at the chair's urging, we're going to set up another meeting and, and explore that further. Last time I checked, uh, we did not opt out of the uh, Central Coast power. So we are paying, uh, you, you know, your bill has the PG&E cost for infrastructure and it has the electricity that you're buying. Um, last time I checked, we are getting our electricity through them because we did not opt out. Um, so we'll, we'll explore whether they're, they, they're following the same programs as PG&E is relative to this new structure that's been proposed, which is still not a very good structure for us. Um, and, and then the other point I wanna make is as we've talked about before, um, now that you've seen this infrastructure, it, it should be crystal clear what we've been saying, which is there is no way we can do that kind of infrastructure and service a hundred buses in our yard. There is not enough room to do all that. Um, and so as we talked about when we showed you the timeline towards becoming a, a zero emission property, um, we are in the process now of, of a two year, less than two year now, review of hydrogen fuel cell. And so if that review looks favorable, 
we, we will come to you and say, hey, can we apply for a grant in 2022, a LONO grant, and try to get a hydrogen fuel cell demonstration project here. That could be two buses or it could be five buses. We'll sort that out later. Uh, and then that would give us a period of time to run those side by side and compare battery electric to hydrogen fuel cell electric, and then to determine what is going to be our approach going forward or what is gonna be our mix of technologies approach going forward. So there's gonna be some pretty exciting years ahead of us here as we try to figure out what the right approach is, but what we're not doing is making what I think are some mistakes that other transit agencies have done, which is to just dive on in with both feet and buy, buy, buy all electric buses. These, these buses are an inferior product. They are not ready mm -hmm. for, for the kind of prime time we need, which is buses that can run on all routes all day on a single charge, like a, like a CNG bus. You fuel it up at night, it runs all day. You don't have to fuel it up again until tomorrow night. Thanks, Alex, that's helpful. Um, in, in the, to, to go a little bit long on that, um, the, the storage, um, uninter uninterrupted storage, I mean, especially since we had, you know, the power outages because of basically the rolling blackout situation. What are we doing in terms of um, storage, the batteries for that? Because obviously, you know, you could charge when you, you pull up, but maybe um, not only could you charge when you pull up, but maybe during the day in some sort, being able to get the batteries so that they could also be used either when power goes out or as an, in addition to help um, other buses getting getting fueled up essentially. Are, are we doing any storage? I mean, storage is gonna be a huge right. component when it comes to doing EV. It, it's a developing area. We're monitoring that. Uh, the, the biggest issue is where do you put all of those batteries that you're going to say in the off peak charge and then draw down on to charge your buses that night during the peak. So it's an area that we got to continue to monitor. Um, but given that we're going to explore hydrogen fuel cell over the next couple of years, I think we want to be careful not to give away too much of our very limited property for, for, for the, the space intensive battery storage, because we may need that space if we have to build some sort of small, you know, uh, hydrogen, I, I think it's called a hy hydrogen ionizing plant on property versus taking deliveries. If you take deliveries, you have to have a storage tank for it. So there's a lot of complicated parts to this. And our parcel that we park 100 buses is constrained. I, I can't go get some adjacent property and grow that. I have to work within that footprint. Thank you. So uh, I'll, I'll chime into that. But, but we, uh, CTE is also looking into uh, our possibilities of where we can put uh, storage capacity. So that uh, further down the line, we will get a report of what our possibilities are, what, what we can, if possible, where we can put storage. So that's not, uh, uh, it's not out of the ballpark. So we're still thinking, we're still, like I said, doing the studies of what the possibilities are. So it, it's in the works also. Thanks, Freddie, that's helpful. Any other comments or questions? Okay, let me ask um, Louie again, do we need to take a formal motion on this? Can we have a consensus of accepting this report? Consensus is fine. Any objection to accepting this as reported? I see none, that's fine. Finally, um, we are uh, about to adjourn. Uh, we are. Right. Do we need a vote on canceling our December meeting, or again, can that be by consensus? Consensus is fine. Again, um, I, I talked this over with Gina, and although you adopt a calendar, it says you can change it. So consensus is fine. Okay, well then on recommendation of staff, if there's no essential uh, item that we need to consider in December, our next regular meeting will be, and again, this is objection. I'm not hearing any. Our next regular meeting will be January 22nd, 2021. That's a Friday morning again at nine o'clock. I uh, will thank everybody for their participation. I wanna thank the members of the public that commented on today's meeting and particularly thank our staff and consultants for the wonderful work that we've uh, been presented with this morning. Any additional comments from board members? Tina, Trina, yes. I'm sorry. Trina, yes. I just wanna say it's been a pleasure working for the board uh, or participating with the board. I think that by the January meeting, there may be already um, a change of guard when it comes to the assignments for the boards and commissions. 
So I think that when we started out the meeting, there was gonna be some salutations and some goodbyes to some of our board members. And since that December meeting is not going to occur, I just wanna make sure that um, I put it out there to say thank you very much for all of the boards, all of the commissioners um, that I've worked with here that are not moving forward because of, of us retiring out essentially. So again, I wanted to say thank you for that and um, for also the staff for working with us and getting us up to speed on the materials of and the dynamics of the agency. So again, thank you very much. Thanks, with, with that, less objection from board members, I'm gonna assume that if for some reason any of the members that are retiring from the board um, will be invited back to have, hear some comments from your colleagues before you go. So uh, even if Watsonville, for example, it makes its appointments earlier and it, it, you're not the official representative in January, I assure you we'd like to invite you back to that meeting. So that'll, that'll be our assumption at this point. I mean, I think you may have missed that um, they're saying, uh, you know, historically the um, changes don't occur until uh, later January. So our thinking was that all of you'd be able to come back. But as Mike said, if, if, if for some reason one agency is timing is different, um, please join us in January. We will send a formal invitation, believe me, if, we're, if uh, we find <laughs> anybody's being replaced. Thank you. So, so again, thank everybody. We're going to adjourn our meeting. I want to thank everybody for the tone of this meeting. I don't take it for granted. We have very difficult times and controversial issues. Everybody stay safe. And we're about to leave this meeting. I don't, I don't have the ability to end it. Somebody else from community television will <laughs> now send us all away. Thank you. Everybody Happy holidays. Good holiday season and stay safe. Happy holidays. Thanks, Trina. Happy holidays.